Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our city council chambers. I'm council member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th district of the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as chair of the city council committee on public safety. I welcome each and every one of you here to our very important hearing. I am proud to serve as chair and join with my colleague, council member Andrew Cohen, who's chair of the committee on mental health, developmental disability, alcoholism, substance abuse, and disability services, and thank chair Cohen for co-chairing this important hearing today, the NYPD's response to persons in mental health crisis. I would also like to thank the members of the public safety as well as the mental health committee who are here. The safety of every New Yorker in every neighborhood and every community is of paramount importance to each and every one of us. And we simply depend on the hardworking public servants, the men and women of the NYPD to protect us each and every day. Every day, the NYPD responds to hundreds of 911 calls involving individuals in a mental health crisis. In fact, on average, the department responds to approximately 150,000 emergency calls for services involving individuals with mental health issues. Not only do officers respond to 911 calls, they encounter emotionally disturbed persons and other individuals that are dealing with mental health issues while they're on patrol or being flagged down by New Yorkers for assistance. That is why we want to make sure that our officers are trained and equipped with all of the necessary resources when confronted with these 911 calls to ensure that these interactions between officers and New Yorkers that are dealing with mental health issues conclude safely, effectively, as well as with compassion. The department has a multi-level strategy to deal with those in mental health crisis, from guidance in their patrol guide to specialty units such as ESU or the hostage negotiation team. With this support and additional training, the vast majority of the over 100,000 annual mental health calls end peacefully and without any incident to the officer as well as the civilian. However, we know that there are still challenges that we face today. It is essential that we continue to strike a necessary but delicate balance between both public safety, mental health, as well as the rights of all residents of this city, regardless of their mental health status. The recent deaths of Deborah Dana, a 66-year-old Bronx resident living with schizophrenia, as well as Dwayne Henyi, an emotionally disturbed individual who resided in Brooklyn, were both killed during a police interaction, certainly remind us that there continues to be room for improvement. We must ensure that all New Yorkers and officers are safe in all police-civilian interactions. Earlier this year, the Office of the Inspector General for the NYPD published a report evaluating the NYPD's approach to handling interactions with people in a mental crisis. The report raised a number of concerns regarding the implementation of the NYPD's crisis intervention team. As a result of this report, the NYPD IG issued several recommendations in areas for improvement. In April of this year, the NYPD wrote a letter in response to this report outlining their existing training and protocols and guidelines for responding to those New Yorkers in a mental health crisis. We are here this morning to continue the conversation on how to improve the training and respond to those with a mental illness. The committee, both committees, would like to explore what the additional challenges we continue to face, as well as how we can improve the interactions between civilians and police officers. Most importantly, the lessons learned from recent tragic incidents and how we can prevent future incidents from occurring. I believe that is truly all of our goal. This open dialogue has and needs to continue among community members, elected officials, social justice advocates, civil legal service providers, the NYPD, health department professionals, and other city agencies as we collectively move forward. We have a number of representatives from both the public as well as the administration is here, the NYPD and the Office of Mental Health at OMHMH, and I'd like to thank the administration and everyone who is here to testify. I'd like to thank and recognize the members of the Public Safety Committee 
who have joined us today, our minority leader, Steve Matteo, Council Member Vincent Gentili, Council Member Richie Torres, Council Member Jamani Williams, and we have other colleagues here with us, Council Member Paul Levant, Paul Vallone, Council Member Barry Gradenchik, Council Member Joe Borelli, and Council Member Brad Lander. And I also want to recognize the staff who've done all of the work to get us to today's hearing. There's been a lot of conversation on this topic, both publicly and privately, and we wanted to make sure that we brought today's hearing to the forefront. The Committee on Public Safety, the Senior Legislative Council, Deepa Ambakar, our Policy Analyst, Casey Addison, and our Financial Analyst, Steve Reister, and my Chief of Staff, Dana Wax, thank you for your help. And with that, I will turn this hearing over to my fellow co-chair, Council Member Andrew Cohen. Thank you, Chair Gibson. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Andrew Cohen, and I am the chair of the Council Committee on Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, Alcoholism, Drug Abuse, and Disability Services. I am pleased to be co-chairing this hearing with my colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. While focusing on NYPD's response to interactions involving people with mental illness or people in mental crisis, we would also like to learn more about the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's role in assisting and preparing officers for such encounters. Knowing that stigmas and stereotypes of violence still surround persons with mental illness, how can DOHMH better assist law enforcement? What can DOHMH do to, occur, to ensure the tragedies or future tragedies are avoided? Uh, I look forward to examining the current tra training measures, uh, how their effectiveness is measured, whether is it, it is adequate, and how best to support law enforcement in dealing with the most vulnerable among us. I want to acknowledge the members of the committee who have joined us this morning, Council Member Crowley, Council Member Vallone, Council Member Gudrinchik, and Council Member Borelli. Lastly, I want to thank the committee staff for their work in preparation for this hearing. Uh, Nicole Levine, our legislative counsel, our outgoing legislative counsel, Sylvester Yavana, our new legislative counsel, Michael Benjamin, our policy analyst, Jeanette Merrill, our finance analyst, and Kate Theobald, my legislative counsel. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair Cohen. And with that, we will begin today's hearing with our first panel that's already assembled, our Deputy Commissioner for the NYPD, Susan Herman, Lieutenant Angela Ho from the NYPD, and the Executive Deputy Commissioner of DOHMH, Dr. Gary Belkin. Welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. And now we'll have the administering of the oath by the council, and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you once again for joining us. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great, thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Gibson, Chair Cohen, and members of the council. I am Susan Herman, Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing in the New York City Police Department. Today I am joined by Lieutenant Angela Ho of the NYPD's Training Bureau, as well as Dr. Gary Belkin, Executive Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to address the Council on the NYP's response to people in mental health crisis. I want to start by noting our strong partnership with DOHMH. Our work together has led to productive connections with the mental health system, community-based providers and organizations, and social services. Our partnership has been critical to advancing NYPD practices and approaches around health and safety and changing the way the NYPD interacts and responds to those in crisis. Throughout my testimony, I will highlight several ways our partnership is thriving. Every day, NYPD officers safely and effectively interact with members of the public who experience a mental health crisis. On average, the NYPD annually receives 160,000 emergency calls for service involving a person in mental crisis who may be in danger to themselves or others. In addition to these calls, officers on patrol encounter individuals suffering from a mental health crisis in a variety of ways, when summoned to other types of emergency calls, when flagged down by members of the public, or when officers simply observe a distressed person in a public place. With a population of 8.5 million residents and a large influx of daily commuters, it is not surprising that officers on patrol have anecdotally recounted that they interact with a member of the public in mental crisis nearly every day. Consequently, it is critical that officers are equipped to manage these situations and bring them to successful and safe conclusions. 
One of the department's most important recent training initiatives, the Crisis Intervention Team Training, or CIT, builds on training we have offered for quite some time and adds new components designed to enhance our work. CIT is designed to teach officers to effectively assist individuals who are in crisis due to mental health problems, developmental disorders, or are under the influence of substances. Our four-day class, based on national best practices, was developed by NYPD experts in partnership with DOHMH, with input from mental health professionals and researchers from local universities, as well as members of the mental health community, including consumers, attorneys, and advocates. Officers learn how to demonstrate empathy, build rapport with subjects, slow down situations, and de-escalate negative emotions. The training is a combination of lectures and interactive role playing in the police academy's mock environments. Professional actors portray people with various mental health problems and people under the influence of chemical substances in different stages of crisis. The actors challenge officers with various scenarios and the clinicians and the academy staff together show officers how to develop a sense of connection with emotionally or mentally troubled individuals in the throes of crisis. The training seeks to improve officers' de-escalation techniques when interacting with physically combative subjects in order to create a safer situation for the officer and the subject. The training includes mental health consumers who speak about their positive or negative interactions with the police. Their comments help develop greater understanding of mental illness and promote a constructive dialogue between the trainees and those who have experienced it. While the course is not intended to transform officers into clinicians or social workers, the goal is to impart a better understanding of mental illnesses to help officers assist a person in crisis and gain voluntary compliance. Since the inception of this four-day training in June 2015, close to 6,400 uniform members have been trained. Also worth mentioning separately is our Mental Health First Aid Training Initiative geared toward our civilian members. To date, we have trained 680 school safety agents, and we plan on expanding the training to include over 1,100 individuals in the rank of PRA, SPA, and PAA this October. This is not to say that this training initiative is a panacea for all interactions that the NYPD has with those in mental crisis, nor does it mean that officers who have not received this enhanced training are without skills to deal with those in mental health crisis. The training and skills I outlined have long been taught to officers in the emergency services unit and the hostage negotiation team, and to a lesser extent, to all officers. In fact, our ESU officers serve as a model for the country. They receive over eight months of training and are often asked to train other jurisdictions. The NYPD attributes our history of overwhelmingly successful interaction with those in crisis to a robust training program that predates our new CIT initiative. The department trains our recruits, our supervisors, and specialized units so that they learn to interact appropriately with members of the public who may be suffering from mental illness. Although the goals and objectives of the training may differ slightly at each level, each training provides attendees with core skills to identify the symptoms of mental illness and gain voluntary compliance of an individual who may or may not pose a danger to himself or others. For example, since 2003, the department has provided advanced training for newly promoted supervisors on interacting with members of the public who are in crisis. This training is offered during the sergeants, lieutenants, and captains leadership development courses. The goal is to reacquaint newly promoted supervisors with the skills necessary for managing situations involving people with mental illness. Taught by NYPD personnel in conjunction with DOHMH, supervisors of each rank are taught to recognize the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional symptoms associated with mental illness. Recently, we have begun to train all sergeants and lieutenants in the full CIT course. Furthermore, all NYPD recruits at the police academy receive additional training, apart from CIT, on how to respond to those in mental crisis. Recently, recruits have been given more focused training on de-escalation techniques, 
to enable them to diffuse tense situations, including those involving mentally distressed persons. Concepts of de-escalation and conflict are interwoven throughout the recruit curriculum in recurring themes that are consistently emphasized. The listening and engagement techniques emphasized in all of their de-escalation training help recruits develop confidence to interact with members of the public who may be suffering from mental crisis. In addition to classroom modules, recruits also receive over nine hours of scenario-based training on interacting with those in distress. This scenario training taught in mock environments reinforces concepts learned in the classroom and highlights practical tactics recruits can learn in the field, can use in the field, excuse me. The combination of our new CIT initiative along with our robust multi-tiered training continues to be effective in equipping officers to interact with people in mental crisis. In order to vividly illustrate this point, I would like to first like to highlight two such interactions by officers who at the time had not yet received our new CIT, followed by two examples of interactions by officers who had completed the course. In this past February, two officers responded to a call concerning a suicidal male in a hotel. The man's mother called 911 and said that her son possibly had a firearm and planned to kill himself. The officers responded to the hotel and knocked on the door of his room. Without opening the door, the man twice told officers to leave. Nevertheless, the officers entered the hotel room using a key and found the man on the edge of the bed with a loaded firearm pointed at his head. Using skills acquired at the academy, one of the officers began talking to the man to establish a rapport with him. By speaking empathetically, the officer was able to get the man to put down the firearm. Through calm and measured communication, the officers gained the man's voluntary compliance in a situation that could have instantly turned deadly. In November of 2016, several officers responded to an EDP call concerning a shirtless male with a knife inside a commercial building. The officers responded to the scene and spoke with the employees who were working there. The employees had observed a man entering the building while acting extremely erratically. The officers proceeded through the premises and encountered the man who then barricaded himself in a restroom. Officers cleared civilians from the area, awaited the response of a supervisor, the ESU unit, and the hostage negotiation team, and began a dialogue with the man. After speaking with the man and utilizing crisis communication and de-escalation techniques, the officers were able to gain the individual's voluntary compliance without the use of force and prior to the arrival of the specialized units. In the following two examples, officers had received CIT training. Last January, officers responded to a call from a 40-year-old woman in crisis armed with knives who was actively threatening her father's life and daring the officers to shoot her. Officers sought voluntary compliance through communication while in tactical cover. After repeated attempts to get the woman to drop the knives were not successful, an officer tased her, allowing other officers to safely subdue her. A later, a later conversation with the distressed woman's family revealed that she had intended for the police to kill her when she called 911. In April of 2016, a police officer stated that CIT training gave her the skills necessary to keep a woman who was threatening to jump off the 10th story of a building talking long enough so that ESU could arrive and pull her to safety. The person in crisis stated she was determined to commit suicide and had wrapped herself in a sleeping bag to not create a mess. The police officer was able to engage her long enough so that she could be saved. These situations are representative of encounters that occur on a daily basis between NYPD patrol officers and people in mental crisis. They demonstrate the regular and often exemplary work of NYPD officers. Another innovative aspect of our response to persons in mental crisis is the new co-response teams. CRTs consist of NYPD officers working alongside DOHMH clinicians. The teams conduct community-based, proactive outreach to people living with mental illness and or substance misuse who have been identified as having escalating levels of violence. Referrals from various stakeholders, including precinct commanders, government partners such as homeless services, and social service providers identify those who have an elevated risk of violence to themselves or others. 
This outreach is done before the person decompensates to the point that they are in crisis. This team approach provides a rich opportunity for DOHMH and NYPD to review historical information about identified mental health consumers, including NYPD records as well as mental health records available to DOHMH. Prior to deployment in the field, co-response teams create a needs-based approach to a planned encounter based on known risk factors. Co-response has had 676 referrals, of which 487 were appropriate for co-response. Over 780 contacts with these clients were made, and over 730 had successful dispositions, including the client being connected to services, transported to a provider, and entering treatment. The NYPD constantly seeks to improve the outcomes of police contacts with people in crisis through ongoing review and assessment of our procedures and training. While our current CIT training in many respects exceeds national standards, the ultimate goal for the department is not just the addition of a single CIT course, but a larger comprehensive response, including a broader collaborative effort among law enforcement several other government agencies, mental health officials, and the community. We are already engaged in interagency working groups, including the Mayor's Mental Health Council and the Quarterly Advisory Group, co-hosted by the NYPD and DOHMH, with members including other government agencies, advocates, community-based health care providers, civil rights attorneys, and consumers. They communicate with us regularly and have had significant input into our work. Incorporating health responses and solutions is a focus of our collaboration with DOHMH and other stakeholders and key to improving engagement with individuals in crisis. The Department will continue to work diligently and constructively with both internal and external stakeholders to fully implement this larger goal. To that end, the Department supports collaborating with the Council on your desire to create a mayoral working group. We support such a group to assess the city's overall response to individuals in crisis by not only looking at the multifaceted collaborative approach currently being employed by agencies, but also the potential role of governmental and non-governmental stakeholders who are not currently engaged. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner. We appreciate your presence and your testimony, and certainly speaking uh, in great detail about the work that the men and women of the NYPD do each and every day, the 160,000 calls that are received into the 911 call system, obviously an incredible amount of work, a lot of detail, and certainly the de-escalation and a number of techniques that have been uh, put forth by the department. We really want to thank you and commend you because it's not easy. Um, for those of us that have interactions in our communities with many of our own constituents and loved ones who have um, a relative or a friend that's dealing with a mental health crisis, uh, it's a real challenge sometimes to ensure that they get the level of assistance. And I appreciate you acknowledging some of the uh, city's efforts like Thrive NYC and Healing NYC, NYC Safe. There are a number of them, Thrive, to make sure that, you know, the first aid, mental health, training, and other mechanisms are really in place for many, many New Yorkers. So uh, we really appreciate that. Before I get to my questions, just want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Robert Cornegie of the committee. Thank you for joining us. And I want to just start by asking, specifically the content of the CIT training that you described, I wanted to find out what the overlap is with crisis intervention, CIT, and the de-escalation training that you talked about. So last year, I believe my colleagues and I had an opportunity to visit the academy, and we went through the two, three-day scenario of de-escalation techniques, of the compassion, and other really unique opportunities that officers were being trained on to deal with members of the public. So what I wanted to understand further is what is the overlap between the de-escalation training as well as the CIT, if there is an overlap? I believe that the training that you observed last year was part of the in-service training. Yes, it was, the in-service two-day, yes. Right, so it was particular in-service training that was developed for officers who had been out of the academy for quite some time. 
Um, what I wanted to highlight in my testimony is that the CIT course builds on a very strong foundation of work on not only crisis communication, but de-escalation techniques that already is woven throughout the academy curriculum. CIT reinforces that work. It also gives particular information about mental illness and substance misuse so that officers are more likely to recognize what they identify, what they are seeing when they're seeing somebody who is um, using substances or uh, suffers from mental illness and respond appropriately. So the CIT is a more sophisticated, four-day concentrated course that uh, re-emphasizes and adds to, builds on the de-escalation training and the communication skills that all recruits learn and have been learning for quite some time. Okay. Um, you indicated in your testimony that the recruits that are in the academy when we started in June of 2015 are all being trained in CIT, and many of them I speak to, so I, I can see the work that, you know, they were getting and the experience from the academy itself. But you talked about close to 6,400 uniform members of service have been trained. Um, is there going to be an expansion where universally every MOS is going to have CIT training? How is that going to work? So when we first began, we were training recruits as well as in service. We were doing right. both at the same time. The national standard for CIT training is that you have no more than 30 people in a class at a time. So right. to comport with that national standard is challenging when you have a department as large as ours. Right now, we have suspended the training for recruits and are focusing on supervisors sergeants and lieutenants who respond to every call involving a person with mental distress. So if we have right now 6,400 people in the field who have been trained, we're focusing on sergeants and lieutenants now. They will all be trained by the end of 2018, all the supervisors. That means that at every scene, there will definitely be someone, a supervisor at least, and likely someone on patrol as well, an officer as well. But we're focusing on supervisors first to make sure that we definitely have someone on the scene who is CIT trained. And then we'll go back to recruits and general in-service training. Okay, what's the duration of time you anticipate that suspension being in place? So the supervisors will all be trained by the end of 2018. Okay. And then we go back to everybody else. Okay. And does that also apply? What, what about patrol officers? Not recent graduates, but patrol officers? That's the in-service training that I'm okay. speaking about. And we are focusing on patrol. That is the national standard, is that you focus on patrol. There are many parts of the department that are not as high a priority as patrol. Okay. And beyond 2018, as you have captains, lieutenants, and the supervisors that are all trained on CIT, you revert back. Sergeants and lieutenants. Sergeants and lieutenants. You revert back to the recruits that are in the academy. And in service. And in service. Um, does that also include an expansion to NCOs and community affairs officers, those that really deal with the sure. public on they, every They day? would be included in the general in service, absolutely. General. And could be a priority. At, as needed, we have focused on particular task forces or parts, units in the department, and we will continue to do that. Okay, got it. And I wanted to ask further, um, in terms of the CIT, how is that different from the specialized units you talked about, like ESU right. and hostage negotiation? I know they have training that's a lot more expansive, but is there a lot of overlap in the curriculum of the training? Well, I would say that the, the specialized units, HNT and ESU, get basically everything that you get in the CIT training plus a whole lot more. So there's a lot of overlap. They're, they're learning crisis communication. They're learning tactical skills. But ESU officers are trained for about eight months. Mm -hmm. It's a very extensive training. How many ESU officers do we have now in h and Do you have a number? I don't have a number. We can get that to you. Okay. Okay. And basic understanding, when a call comes into 911, 
how was it determined that the call could potentially be classified as an EDP? Uh, do the patrol officers that receive the calls make that determination? And when and if the decision is made to bring in ESU or HNT, how does that work? Can you give us a basic understanding of how sure. that works? So a call comes in to 911. It's a civilian 911 call taker who's answering right. the phone, asking about the emergency, and they have a series of questions that they're taught to ask that elicit enough information pretty quickly to determine whether this is someone with a mental health problem likely to be in danger. So once that is determined, they're notifying EMS, they're notifying patrol, and ESU is notified at the same time. A supervisor in the precinct is also aware of this call, and as, as a dispatcher dispatches this call, it may be given to a particular uh, car. The supervisor is aware of who in the precinct has been trained in CIT and um, can redirect or direct that call as appropriate. If it's feasible to have a CIT trained person um, answer that, that's the directive that officers have now that's in the patrol guide. If the responding officers determine, for whatever reason, the situation has been resolved, it's not as dangerous or as complicated or it's unnecessary, it's unfounded, they, for whatever reason, ESU doesn't need to be there, they can say that ESU is unnecessary. But it's a supervisor who would make that um, decision unless it's resolved completely before the supervisor gets there. Right, okay, so I just want to further understand because you mentioned that each supervisor would obviously know the patrol officers on that particular shift, that platoon, they would know the patrol officers that are assigned to a sector, they would know if they have the CIT training. So when the call comes in and it goes to, you know, if I'm in Sector Adam and I'm an officer trained in CIT and I get the call, the supervisor obviously, you're saying, would know that and would allow me and my partner the opportunity to respond to that call. So what I'm trying to understand is what happens in a scenario if, and I can't imagine that for any particular platoon, you would not have sector patrol cops that would not be trained in CIT. So, well, we have 6,400 right. officers now, so it okay. is possible that that would be the case. But our goal is for every tour to always have, currently, to always have at least one person who's CIT trained. And every week, we're training 90 more people, every week. So um, we're, we're training at a pretty fast clip. Okay, so how do you ensure for the precincts that don't have as many as others. So how do you determine as you roll out and expand and get more patrol officers trained on CIT, are you looking at existing 911 calls and the geographic area, the precinct, to say, like my precinct in the Bronx, the 4-4, has a high number of EDP calls into 911, so those officers obviously need to be trained at a higher rate than others. How does that work to make sure that there's balance and at least there's in a response where CIT-trained patrol officers are working on each shift? I think, I think your question is, is a good one because what you're indicating is we not only need to have a balance, we need to be mindful of where there are more call, calls. Right. In the beginning, when we first started training in CIT, we were focusing on um, the Bronx and Manhattan North. And Manhattan North, both the Bronx and Manhattan North. In the beginning, okay. there was a high concentration of in-service training in those areas. Okay. Then when we started training all recruits, those recruits are dispersed among the entire city, right. all precincts. And our goal, as we said, is every precinct, every tour should have one. So we're, we're looking at that. But we are, as I said, we're trying to keep training people. We will have all supervisors throughout the city trained by 2018 so that any EDP call anywhere in the city will definitely have at least one person who's been trained in CIT. I just want to ask a question about the uh CRTs, the co-response teams, which I've been given uh, several suggestions that I wanted to bring it to your attention. And I, I love the idea of having, you know, a, a co-team, a response team that goes out with officers. But the CRT that you described seems 
much more preventative in focusing on those New Yorkers that have already been identified to have an existing mental illness, whether they've been a series of 911 calls or these are individuals that officers may have a relationship with and know. And so they're already on our radar. That's a good thing. They're on somebody's radar. Right, they're on someone's radar. That's a good thing. police and others. I guess what I'm trying to, to ask is for the potentially many, many others that are not on anyone's radar, not on DOHMH, NYPD, they're not on anyone's radar, but potentially still need existing assistance. Are you looking at the CRTs, the co-response teams, in terms of expanding them where potentially a mental health counselor could go out with an officer on a call? Is that something that you've talked about? We're certainly looking at um, expanding the capacity of co-response. Uh, we are definitely looking at many ways to involve mental health expertise in guiding officers. They don't necessarily have to be out on a call okay. with every officer, but ways to incorporate the mental health expertise is very appropriate. But I, I think I, I also, I, I hope you appreciate that the people that the co-response teams are seeing certainly are people that are already on our radar, but there are also people who, without the assistance that they're getting from the co-response teams, which, is, which has been enormously effective in connecting them to services, mm -hmm. they might have turned into a crisis. These right. are people who, who, two years ago, if, if there had been a 911 call and we were looking at them and saying, um, look at this person's history, why did somebody not do something, these are those people. We're trying to do something before something awful happens. Right. And in the overwhelming um, number of times that we've interacted with people through the co-response teams, there have been really successful interactions. They've been connected to services. They've been connected mm -hmm. to homeless shelters. Um, we see that they're back on their medications and they're back on track. Okay. Right, no, no, and I, I'm, apologies yeah. for not acknowledging that, but certainly, as I said, preventative, um, preventative services and a multitude of referrals and social services for many of these individuals is great because you're saving their lives and you're giving them an opportunity to get the assistance that they yeah. need. Um, and I appreciate that. I attribute it to the work that a lot of the DV officers do with their clients where they do regular home visits. And, and just basic checkups to make sure that the New Yorker is taking their meds, they're you know visiting their programs and things of that nature. Yeah, it's not it's not quite. Let's check on anybody who has mental illness. It's much more people who have been identified as um, likely to have mental illness, but they have already demonstrated escalating levels of violence. So this is someone who's on somebody's radar because their actions are calling out um, to us. It's not just somebody who's off their meds. It's somebody who's maybe in a shelter who one week has um, loudly cursed at people and another week has thrown a chair and then a month later threatens people. That's escalating levels of mm -hmm. violence. Right. That's the client of co-response. Some are in shelters, some are at home, some are homeless on the street. They're in many different kinds of situations, but someone believes that their behavior is getting worse. Right, okay. Um, when a 911 call comes in and the patrol officers respond to a person in mental health crisis, um, many of the cases and calls that I've been privy to, I know usually end with an individual going to the hospital. Um, is there any level of follow-up and, you know, how far do officers take that particular call? Is there a referral of services? How does that work to make sure that, you know, the individual that's either taken into police custody or they're taken to a hospital, what are we doing in terms of following up with that individual to make sure that they're getting the assistance needed? So I'm going to let Dr. Belkin okay. answer that, but just to say that um, individuals that are identified by us as being in mental health crisis, they are brought to a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not taken to custody immediately. They're, they may be arrested, but they're taken immediately to a hospital. Okay. Would you like to talk about Dr. the follow-up? Yeah, and, and thanks for the question, because you signaled uh, Thrive Initiatives, NYC SAFE in particular, um, and why we're working with uh, NYPD um, 
uh, uh, we share this idea of a spectrum which, of response, which, which is really what you're bringing up, that, uh, and that those pieces talk to each other. So um, NYC SAFE is one example. Um, uh, is a big step towards giving this encounter with a police officer to have more options, more bridges back into the treatment system. Um, and so we've built out an array of uh, new treatment options, uh, mobile teams, um, uh, other treatment teams that we've enlarged, capacity of, uh, so that uh, there are those options. Uh, and we are connecting with hospitals and with NYPD through the co-response teams to refer uh, people into those options. Uh, I just want, 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 want to raise one more question before I turn it over to my chair. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I want to go back a little bit because um, I just want to further understand the expansion of CIT, um, making sure that, you know, obviously every patrol officer, every supervisor is well equipped. Um, as you're expanding, how are we best making sure that every precinct as best we can, you know, my concern is, is there may be those situations where, you know, two patrol officers are not trained in CIT and there is a person that needs assistance. So I just want you to expand on that just a little bit in terms of time frame and how we build this out to make sure that all of our precincts and all of the platoons are covered. So we're training citywide. Right. The sergeants and lieutenants, that's a citywide effort. So that would be every tour every precinct, right. somebody will be CIT trained okay. at every interaction. Once we've trained all of the supervisors, we've also trained, we've trained field training officers, NCOs will yep. get the training. We've trained um, the crisis outreach and support unit, formerly the homeless outreach unit. Mm -hmm. We've trained lots of people, but we have, we are now focusing, after we've trained 6,400 officers who are all over the city currently, we are now focusing on supervisors who are all over the city, and they respond to every single EDP call. Okay. So the capacity challenge we face, obviously we have to have a small setting. You, you mentioned 30. 30. We have to have 30 in a class. In a class. I'd also like to say that the, uh, the people in Memphis who were the first city to adopt this kind of CIT training, uh, their standard for how much training an office, a department should undertake is 25 to 30 percent of patrol. We're almost there, and our plan is to do everybody on patrol. But I just want to say most, many departments around the country are training everybody, but there are many departments around the country that don't believe that it's necessary to train everybody. You just need to have a certain number of people who've had this training, and they affect the uh, the behavior and, and the outcomes sufficiently. Okay, yes, so. I'm, I'm aware of what Memphis is doing. And thankfully, we are the city of New York with 8.5 million residents, and we recognize that we want to get to 100%. Yep. I appreciate the 25 to 30%, but in a city of such great diversity and challenge, um, that's a bare minimum for us. We should always aim to get everyone trained so that there is a level of experience. And I know officers, I've talked to them directly, and they like the CIT training. They think it helps them in the work that they do because there's so many different, you know, forms of a mental illness that are not always visible that you can't see. And we assume that officers are supposed to know it all. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure they're best prepared. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful that we are yep. recognizing that we need to get to 100%. Yep. All I'm saying there. is, as a going. city council, we want to help you get to 100% faster. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, obviously it, it's great that we're focusing on the small setting, which is important, but I definitely think, you know, I'm a little concerned because I want to make sure that we continue to get more and more officers and supervisors in, in CIT training. Okay. I'm glad everyone agrees. Let me turn this over to my colleague, Chair Cohen. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Gibson. Um, you know, first, I guess as a predicate man, I mean, Obviously, most people, if the vast majority of people with mental illness do not you know, have encounters with the police, that it's not, it's not a law enforcement issue for most uh, New Yorkers dealing with, with mental health issues. So I just, I want to be clear on that. And, and I'm not as knowledgeable, obviously, as the chair on the procedures and, and the interactions, but I'm going to 
take advantage of the opportunity to try to educate myself a little bit. Uh, and, I, and I think I'm going to cover some ground that the chair covered again, but just to, so that I understand. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the headlines are, you know, when an, an officer encounters someone, uh, an emotionally disturbed person that they, they did not know that they were going, that they, either the, the, the 911 call didn't make it clear to them that it was an EDP call or for whatever reason they encounter someone. I'm not sure what the procedure is in terms of having a supervisor, like you get to the scene and now you realize that this is, is an emotionally disturbed person. What, I'm not clear on what the procedure is. So there's no sort of step-by-step -step procedure. The patrol guide um, is, is about guidance for officers. And in certain situations, the approach is to keep a certain distance. Um, when, in certain situations, you want to isolate and contain someone. Uh, in other situations, you want to engage and communicate with them and try and de-escalate a situation. And the training helps officers know which situation. If I'm not trained, is, is, does the answer to my question change if I am trained versus I'm not trained? No, because you are trained to some extent. The CIT training is extensive, in-depth, excellent training. It's, it's been evaluated nationally, and we're very pleased that we're offering it. But I don't want to imply that without CIT training, our officers have not gotten already significant appropriate training. They have. So, so They're right better now, off with the CIT training. I, I, I totally, I think everybody agrees with that. Yeah. But if, so if I'm an officer who's not CIT trained, but I find myself in a situation where I'm dealing with an emotionally disturbed person, I'm going to proceed under, under, with the training I have. Which not has taught you communication skills. It's taught you de-escalation skills. We continue to improve our training and add to that training. So an officer in the academy now probably gets more of that kind of training than an officer 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So, but I'm not required to try to call to tell a supervisor that I have an EDP. A supervisor is going to come. Yes. If you, if a supervisor is going to come, if it's been. Uh, that's part of the answer to my question. In other words, I identify that this is an EDP yes, person. Yes, the supervisor is going the first to thing, come. Well, not necessarily the first thing, but one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to call my supervisor and tell them. Yes. That I, yes. even though it wasn't a 911 EDP call. Yes. I, in, now, okay, that, that's the kind, that's, yes. the, that's what yes. I want to know. It's also true that as soon as it is identified as such, um, either by the call taker or the officer, ESU is ready to come and is rolling until they're told not to, that they're not needed. They're automatically coming unless you tell them not to come? They're coming unless they're told not to. Okay. Do you, do you know what the response time is for that? I don't have that, I'm sorry. But I would like to correct something that I said earlier, which was that we are exclusively training supervisors right now. We are training sergeants, lieutenants, as well as one cohort of in-service training every week. Um, is there any uh, reason why the, uh, the responding officer would not wait if they think that uh, that uh, the ESU is necessary? Like they would just, if the situation was That's, the, the person the was reasons. barricaded in their apartment or the person was barricaded in their room or? It's, uh, each situation is completely fact specific and uh, things happen quickly sometimes. They escalate quickly sometimes. People are barricaded one minute and then come out of a room another minute, they're, they're running, there's noise, they're, things happen quickly, and sometimes uh, there's time for ESU to get there and sometimes there isn't. That's why all first responders should have this training, and at some point they will. Okay. Uh, the, the the four-day training, the CIT training, how was that developed? Did, was it developed collaboratively? Did, did you play, did it DOH It was developed play collaboratively between the NYPD and the Department of Health. Um, senior officials in both agencies traveled to other cities, went to state and national conferences, interviewed people from other police departments, observed training in other police departments, and I think it's fair to say that we took the best of what we saw from all the training around the country and added some of our own components to it, but it's, uh, it's based on core components that are similar all over the country. Uh, CIT is taught in jurisdictions all over the country, um, but we have our own NYPD 
DOHMH version. We developed it together. We teach it together. Um, you teach it together? We teach it together in the classroom. There are NYPD Academy instructors and clinicians teaching together, every single cohort. And that means they are not only both engaged in lecture, but they're both engaged in critiquing officers uh, in their role playing and reviewing not only tactics, but communication and physical tactics, verbal communication, all of it, both by the clinician and the NYPD trainer. And again, I think that the chair sort of covered this, and I'm not sure if I'm going to use the right language. Um, in terms of, a, of sort of in the precinct knowing uh, who uh, people... Who has been CIT trained. No, not, no, not who's been CIT trained. Uh, who are potentially EDPs or, you know, frequent flyers, so to speak, people that we get calls about with some, you know, I've, I, you know, I have a very good friend who, you know, sometimes ends up off their medication and is you know, really has some problems, and when they're not, when they take their medication, they're, they're, mm -hmm. you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that they had mental health issues. Uh, are, are precincts aware, like, is there any way to, that you're aware of who these people are, like, if they are a frequent flyer, so to speak? So, one of the reasons that we're training the neighborhood coordination officers in CIT is that they are really walking around their neighborhoods and getting to know community members well. Um, and so that's not a, a formal transfer of a list, but it's communicating with people and seeing how they're doing and talking to families and talking to business people, talking to people who work in the community and getting to know them and getting to know their needs. And that's helpful. But, but uh, and, I, and I, there may be constitutional issues, what our legal issues are keeping, in other words, keeping track there of people. There could very well be. There could very well be. But, um, <laughs> Is there an, an, it is my understanding though that, that you do, that the precinct has some knowledge of, uh, of DV situations, DV victims, uh, that you have more, you have records about that. We is, certainly know about crime victims. That's right. Okay. We I, do I, know about crime victims. I understand. Uh, I do appreciate that. Madam Chair, I may have more questions, but I'm perfectly willing to turn it over at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cohen. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, I just had uh, one question before I turn it over to my other colleagues. Um, I wanted to ask about the process for any particular 911 EDP related call that may end where the individual is injured and or unfortunately killed. What happens, you know, with the investigation and how is that particular case used to look at improvements to existing training? So after um, any use of lethal force or any shooting, there's a very comprehensive review. Every single case in the police department goes through a very comprehensive review of what were the tactics that were used, um, was, how did we get in this situation could it have been done differently? What was, were things done appropriately? And where our training needs to be improved or tweaked, it is. When um, an officer needs instruction on tactics, they get that. Um, we try and learn as much as we can from all of these incidents. And over the years, our training has evolved, our equipment has evolved, our procedures, our patrol guide procedures have changed. Um, because we are learning from every single incident. Okay. And in some of the cases that obviously were very public, um, family members and loved ones that called 911 about a loved one in distress and needing assistance, I wanted to ask about, as again, I go back to my initial question about the expansion of CIT beyond the 6400, and as we expand to all of the supervisors, um, in some of the incidents that we've obviously read and heard so much about, uh, there was a supervisor, a sergeant that was you know, sent to that particular location. So I want to ask, again, as you expand and looking at particular precincts where we need to double up on CIT training, is that something that you're also looking at based on the number of cases and incidents that have happened with a person injured or killed um, while 
a, a particular 911 call was dispatched. Does that make sense? So we are, we are at the point where um, if, if we have all of the supervisors trained, which we will shortly, you'll have a supervisor who has CIT training at every single EDP call. As we train more and more officers, and I, I'm not sure I was clear, I misspoke earlier, we are not only doing sergeants and lieutenants, one cohort of sergeants, one cohort of lieutenants, we're also continuing to do one cohort of in-service training for officers now. So we have three cohorts a week, or 90 people. So we're continuing to fill the, the gaps in CIT trained officer level people throughout the city and we're training sergeants and lieutenants. So we are looking carefully and as we train NCOs and field training officers, we're also, we're also training people who have impact on other people. The field training officers mm -hmm. are constantly supervising right. newly New graduated, right. right? So they have a real impact on their behavior. Okay. How can the city council moving forward uh, be helpful with expanding this and, and moving it along um, in terms of your capacity? So the challenge that the department has right now is obviously it has to be a small classroom style. It has to be a small class. What can class. we do to help? It has to be a small class. It has to be done well. Right. And we have lots of competing training demands training that's required, training that newly becomes appropriate, other initiatives that require mm -hmm. extensive training. Every time we train officers, we're taking them out of the field. That is mm -hmm. always a challenge to balance how many officers do you want to take out of the field on any given day while keeping crime down, while implementing neighborhood mm -hmm. policing, which requires many right. more officers than otherwise. So that's the challenge balancing competing training demands, competing demands for our training facility, our mock environments, keeping the training class small, um, and doing it well while conducting all of the other training that we're required to do and new training that we'd like to do on other topics while keeping crime down and implementing neighborhood policing. That's the challenge. So we're at a point now where we've gone from We've accelerated the training from 30 a week to 90 a week um, okay. recently, uh -huh. and we think that um, that's about what we can do right now. Okay, and you mentioned in your testimony the first aid uh, mental health training for SSAs, for school safety agents. Mm -hmm. um, is that also underway as well, simultaneously? So, yes, it is underway simultaneously. That's a one-day training that's been developed by the health department, and we're giving that to um, the school safety agents as well as other civilian employees. We'll have, we've already trained about 600 school safety agents, and by spring we'll have another 1,100 civilians who've been trained. Okay, we have 5,000 school safety agents, so. We continue to train them. I'm just saying we've already trained 600, but we'll continue to train them. Okay, so by the spring of next year, you'll be at 1,100? By the spring of next year, we will have trained 1,100 civilians, okay. other employees, and we will have a higher number for the school safety agents as well. I'm talking about two different groups of people. Right, no, I understand. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure exactly by next spring how many school safety agents, but we'll continue to train them. Okay, well, no, I guess the reason why I mention it, with school starting Thursday, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the population growing in our public schools, there is obviously a need. Um, many of us have school-based health centers located in the schools itself mm -hmm. um, that are operated by, you know, hospital providers and others. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's coupled with all the work we're doing to make sure that we can obviously um, get beyond 1,100 since we have about 5,000 school safety agents now. It, it complements that work, okay. there's no question. Okay, great, thank you. And, and I'd like to also, if I can ask Dr. Belkin to talk about mental health first aid is really a Department of Health initiative and they have mm -hmm. lots of plans for how they train people. Okay. Yeah, so we're also working with DOE about training other people in the, in the school building and school, school campuses staff. in mental health first aid uh, as well. Uh, principals, teachers, support staff? We're, that's what we're working out with, with, with the Department of Education. 
Okay. Are you talking to any of the union leadership in terms of uh, school aides, lunchroom staff, and, and other support staff that work in the schools as well? We have broad conversations across city agencies, both okay. union and non-union staff, about a, a, a cross-agency approach to training um, a big chunk of our workforce who have daily contact with the same people that we're talking about um, and opportunities to, to interact with them. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now we'll have Council Member Williams for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner et al., uh, for the testimony. I uh, appreciate it. Um, this is a, obviously a, a very important topic. And I, I do want to point out, just as you did, <laughs> that the vast majority of the contacts, the EDPs uh, from the police department go the way they're supposed to, and, and we're glad about that. Um, we do have, a, unfortunately, uh, an amount that does not, and that's where we need to focus a lot of time. I think everyone would agree that we want them all to go the way they're supposed to be, and if people are calling for assistance, we want them to get assistance. But I was um, a few years ago at a uh, press conference with uh, Lord President Eric Adams on gun violence, and a woman ran to the press conference, interrupted on her knees, begging for assistance for her uh, uh, emotionally disturbed son, screaming that she did not want to call the police because she was afraid the police would kill them. Um, and that was a, a horror for me as we tried to get her assistance. But that thought process is out there, and with every successive um, EDP response that does not go the way it's supposed to be, we have a, a population that is now afraid uh, to call for assistance. And we got to figure out how we get them the assistance that they need. And I know at least on that point, um, we all agree. Uh, I, I did have a couple of questions. One, in your testimony, uh, you mentioned a, a few instances of people responding. The first one in February, two officers responded to a call concerning suicide of male in a hotel. My understanding is that if there is a call and the, the EDP person is believed to be armed and dangerous, ESU responds. So was it ESU that responded to that particular call? Um, ESU might have been on their way to that particular call, but I'm describing work that was done by officers before ESU arrived. I see. Okay. ESU would have been dispatched to that, certainly. And the call response teams, the, the call response teams are happening before 911 calls to people who are known to the city, is that correct? Yes, people who, well, it doesn't have to be the city, but people who become known to the city. We get referrals from government agencies like homeless services. We get referrals from community-based health care providers, mental health providers. We get referrals from uh, police, precinct COs and others. Um, we have a quarterly advisory group that the two of us co-host and we solicit uh, recommendations for people who could benefit from co-response. So yes, but it's not currently, it's not in the context of 911. So, but there, so there are no co-response teams presently from, from 911? That is true. Um, at first, it seems that I know that uh, some of my colleagues, including uh, Chair Cohen, the Black Latin Asian Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, requested a, a task force be put in place uh, to find out what's happening, how we best respond to people who call for assistance from EDP, uh, not exclusive to the police department, but including the police department. And it looks like um, there's an agreement there, so I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. I did want to understand the difference between a working group and a task force, if you can help me figure that out. I think we're emphasizing way. working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to understand a little better. Um, is there any time frame of when that working group will be put in place? I, I think that's up to the mayor. I think we're, we're supportive of the idea, but it's really up to the mayor to put it into place. So we have no time frame? I don't have a time frame. All right. I, um, I hope, hoping that we would push uh, both chairs to uh, when that time frame would occur. I think you have the support of the administration yes. um, in the idea, and I'm sure that it's, it's something that will take sure. place. Sure. I just, I know, as you mentioned, um, there's responses to EDPs every single day, and I just want to make sure that we can honestly say we're doing what we can mm -hmm. uh, in an expeditious fashion. Uh, so you did mention some interagency working groups, the Mayor's Mental Health Council, 
quarterly advisory group. I, and I want also the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice Task Force that was created in 2014. Um, so that, so just the, the Mayor's Mental Health Council and quarterly advising group is part of the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice System? The, the Mental Health Task Force, I the Mental Health Council actually, I believe, came out of Thrive. Um, the quarterly advisory group, that's the NYPD DOHMH group, exists as a, uh, a, a a group to give us input into most of the work that we're doing collaboratively, everything from co-response to CIT training to the new diversion centers. Okay, because I know I have the report here from 2014. Um, I, I don't know if the advocates think they're meeting the way they should be meeting after the report, so I just want to make sure I put that on record. I know that maybe there's an advisory group meeting. I don't know if that's the, the entire um, task force that was there. I think the, there have been subcommittees that have met since. Um, the quarterly advisory group that we host is just really limited to those our collaborative efforts, and there's certainly advocates on that committee. Okay. It looked like it was a, a um, pretty good report, but again, they didn't focus on the question of what happens uh, when someone calls for assistance. So I think that's just a very key thing that we should focus well, on. I think they did focus on that because one well, of the key recommendations was CIT training and another recommendation was the diversion centers for pre-arrest situations so everyone should be trained and that would enhance the response. Sure. When oh, I'm looking at the report and so I think it was good and it was, it was a lot of focus on uh, behavioral health and the criminal justice system in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying is true but I think that the, the specific focus and a lot of focus on what happens after that 911 call, who responds, when they respond, uh, needs to be delved in a little deeper mm -hmm. uh, than, than this report. And so hopefully the working group can delve a little bit. And I also agree we, we put too much on the police department. So my hope is we can find out a way uh, to relieve some of that. Also knowing that if God forbid something happens, people are going to ask why weren't the police there. So I know that's a, a question that uh, needs to be dealt with a little bit more. Can, can I just get it? Under, and also the, the Inspector General had a pretty good report, I thought, and hopefully the working group can look in that on January 2017. The police department did respond. I think they left some stuff out, which hopefully they can look at, particularly uh, revising the patrol guide and what happens if uh, are 911 operators train themselves. And, and so 911 operators are trained. Okay. Um, they do not get the CIT training because we don't think it's appropriate for 911 officers, but they do get appropriate training in how to respond to people, how okay. to elicit the information that's critical and how to respond appropriately. They, they get a lot of training. And how long have they been getting that training? I'm told it's about three years that they've about been getting years. that training. Okay. So can you, um, and you might have done it already, I'm sorry. I just, I really want to get walked through what happens. I'm calling 911 um, and I have uh, an emotionally disturbed relative. What happens at that point? You have a relative or you're the person? I have a relative. So you have a relative. Yeah. The, the call taker tries to get critical information about where you are and what's happening and whether person um, is in danger, whether the danger is imminent, whether there are weapons involved, whether there's a history. Someone is dispatched while the call taker is still asking those questions. So someone would be someone from the police department? Someone is dispatched from the police department when we believe that there is danger. And in many cases, there is a possibility of danger, and we are dispatched. So let's, I just want to parse that out. So let's, let's do two tracks. One is there's an emotionally disturbed person who has uh, a lot of issues, uh, and the family's concerned, I'm concerned, with no weapons and one with weapons. Who gets called in both of those? So we are dispatched in both cases. Okay, police let me, department is Let me also be clear that there are many, many tragic instances where we've been told that there are no weapons involved and there have been weapons involved. And there are many tragic incidents where we've been told that someone is not violent and in fact they are violent. Okay. So we go when, they be when we believe that there's a an chance of danger, even involving somebody who, somebody observes somebody walking in the middle of the street and they think they're acting erratically. Um, there's a danger to that person. Sure. And so we go. 
Okay, so now, now what happens? So the police goes. The um, police go. EMS are called at the same time. They respond. EMS are called at the same time for both tracks? Yep. One with a weapon, one without? Yes. Okay. And so EMS responds, NYPD responds, a supervisor, officers will respond. Um, as of this winter, every command in the city knows who in their command has been CIT trained. Those lists are updated on a monthly basis. So a dispatcher will dispatch car X, and if someone, someone at the, uh, the supervisor at the precinct is supposed to review lists, if it's feasible to have a CIT training, they might redirect that call or just let it go if it seems appropriate who's responding to it. Those lists are updated on a monthly basis. So patrol officers respond, EMS is on its way, supervisor is also on his or her way, every single EDP call, whether it's identified by the call taker or later identified by the officer. And ESU is preparing to go and rolling until they are told you're not needed. And that decision is made by a supervisor. And so, uh, but most times the police department is the one that's first on the scene, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, now, what is the protocol? Are the officers with the CIT training take charge of the scene or any officer that arrives? The officer that, I, I don't think we have a, a protocol of who takes charge as much as who, what the situation allows for. Sometimes, sometimes he's going to develop better rapport with somebody and sometimes I'm going to develop better rapport. And if I don't have the CIT training but I'm working with somebody and it seems like we have a good rapport, I'm going to keep talking to that person. But I have a CIT trained person here. All right. I, I mean, I think we do have to work out some protocols. I, I think if, if the CIT, and the IG actually said the CIT training was pretty good, uh, but obviously You're not. welcome to come and observe the CIT training whenever you'd like. Sure, I would love from, to. All um, over the country, all over the world have observed it. It's quite good. And so my thing is that if, the, if it's good, it's probably preferable if a CIT training officer was the one that... It is good, but it's not a panacea. And okay. sometimes officers experience, sometimes officers particular techniques. And remember I said that all officers have already gotten considerable training. And years of experience are often very um, influential in how somebody behaves. So it's great to have a CIT trained officer and we want to train everybody, but we're not at the point where we're saying whoever a CIT trained um, commands the situation. Sure, that concerns me a little bit. I'm I don't just, think I'm you would want that though. Either. I hear you. I, I do want everybody trained, but I understand. Um, and the other thing that concerns me is, and we got to find the medium is, um, when the call comes in, it seems it's the people who are responding normally respond uh, to criminal behavior. And I want us as a city to move away from that. So uh, somehow, if we're coordinating with another agency like EMS or whether CIT trained. EMS is trained, called on all EDP calls. I understand, but most of the times that I've seen, and I've seen them just from my neighbor and others, it's usually the police that are a heavy presence there. And I've seen people actually try to uh, engage in another way, and they're moved back. And so I just want to get into it so that everyone feels whether they believe so rightly or wrongly now, but everyone feels that the response is more of someone who needs uh, a medical attention or other type of attention mm -hmm. besides what is usually responded to by criminal, uh, for criminal behavior. And I don't, th I don't think we've reached that yet, and I'm hoping that us as the City Council will work with you to get there. And that's, that's what my issue is, and I think most folks will believe that, that the response is not what it needs to be for someone who is uh, in, a, in a medical crisis at that time. Understanding, and I'll say this again, and some of my folks will probably be upset, but understanding, I do understand if I don't, only medical people respond and something happens, people are going to ask where were the police. So I do understand that it's necessary for them to be there. I'm trying to figure out how we get it so that the response is a little differently. And lastly, and I'll turn it back over before I overstay my time with the chair, which I appreciate it. Uh, of course, um, uh, what triggered some of these questions for me uh, was uh, Dwayne June. I'll lift his uh, name up because uh, it happened in my district, uh, was shot and killed. Uh, we'll be hearing from their, their family shortly. Uh, the officer that uh, killed Mr. June also uh, shot someone 
nine months before, who was also EDP. Um, we'll be hearing from them, family, Mr., uh, the Presley family as well. I'm trying to figure out what would prompt training. I know we're trying to get to everyone, and I don't want to talk about the specifics of any case because I know you won't, but it seems to me if, uh, if there is an officer that was involved with the EDP um, that ended in um, deadly force, that might be a prompt to get them CIT training so that wouldn't happen again. So what in the department besides, uh, what are you using now to figure out who gets training and what could prompt an officer to get training ahead of whatever that system is you have in place? So we have lots of systems in place to determine when an officer needs particular tactical training or instruction in a particular way. We are trying to train all patrol officers in CIT. As I said, we're training, emphasizing training of supervisors right now so that they can be on the scene and help to control how it goes with a little bit more training. We have an early assessment unit. We have a risk management unit that identify officers who may need particular kinds of training. We have for years and still do give officers particular training that we think they need, typically around tactics, um, when we think that tactics were used appropriately or not appropriately. As you know, I'm not going to talk about a particular case, but I will tell you that there are many systems in place to give people um, tactical retraining. So just for, for clarity, because you mentioned there's systems to do risk assessment as well, um, so if an officer is involved with an EDP that results in uh, deadly force being used, that would not be put in to a system to say this officer may need uh, CIT training or additional training? Any, any use of force is evaluated, and the officer's behavior is evaluated um, and determined whether that officer needs more tactical training or not. Okay. I... I, I let me, let me just sure. maybe put a little context on this um, sure. notion of people being afraid to call the NYPD. We have, we have 160,000 EDP calls a year. When you look at all of those calls, all of them that happen throughout the year, and you look at any level of force that is used from taking somebody down to subdue them to um, a use of pepper spray to um, use of a taser to use of non-lethal weapons to lethal force, the entire spectrum, anything from any just taking somebody down to restrain them, that's considered use of force. That entire spectrum when we're looking at our EDP calls, it's less than 1% of those calls when any use of force is employed at all. Any in that entire spectrum. So I think that's worth saying. Any, any death is tragic and injuries are tragic and our goal as your goal is zero. And we are working towards that. But I want a little bit of perspective and I think it would be helpful for the public to have a little perspective in how infrequently any level of force is used. So I, I want to say this, and I want to uplift that because it's important to make sure we mention that, and that's important. But I don't want to take away the experiences of the 1% that Nor you spoke I. about. Nor do I. And um, that same kind of statistical analysis can be applied to everything that we talk about in policing. So the vast majority of interactions I've had with police officers have been very good. That doesn't take away the experiences that mm -hmm. I had have been very bad, and we have to focus on those. And the other thing is when many times deadly force is used, uh, even if it was an error, we often feel there is an accountability. And so uh, that is something that has I'm to be sorry. put. We there, often feel there, there is, is an accountability uh -huh. when the mistakes are made. And so that has to be interjected into the conversation well, as I, well. I'm, I want to be clear that sure. that spectrum that I'm describing um, do not necessarily all include mistakes or problems. It's subduing somebody, restraining somebody, using um, I'm agreeing any, with you any on, level I'm a, of force. I'm agreeing with you on that, 
I just want to make sure we don't take away the part of the conversation that I'm having yep. because we have to have it and yep. we have to make sure that uh, people's voices are heard no question. and how they're feeling is, is respected and validated as experiences. Mm -hmm. There's no question and we need to learn from every single encounter that we have and we are. Um, we've trained, we have changed many things even within this last year from, from the fall of last year through now. There are lots of changes in our procedures and our protocols and um, I think that speaks to our desire to have zero, just as you do. I, I agree, and also agreeing to the uh, working group, I think it's good as well. Um, I do just want to again say, I think if an officer was involved in the EDP shooting, that should have somehow prompt some additional uh, training at minimum. Um, and again, I'm going to speak specifically now. Um, that is one thing on the uh, June case that disturbed me because there were four officers that responded. Three of them had CIT training. One of them did not. The one who did not was the one who fatally shot Dwayne June and also uh, shot uh, Dwayne Presley almost nine months before. And so I think we should use that to try to figure out uh, when we're, what is prompting us to give a training. I know there's a lot of officers that have to be trained and you have a system, uh, but maybe we can just look at that so that if we see someone who has been involved, that person could be trained ahead of schedule so that it doesn't happen again, at least with that particular officer. That's it for me, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair. Thank you again. I'm looking forward to continuing to work to, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. I just had a, a few more questions. I wanted to ask about the average calls that we've been uh, shared, the 160,000. Do you record how often ESU or H&T are dispatched? Of those calls, do you have an assessment? We do. We do now. Um, we began in um, we are now recording when when ESU responds and when ESU um, removes has participated in having somebody removed. It's been 138 times since May, um, between May through August. 20th of this year when we started recording that. Okay. And with these specialized units, um, while you couldn't today give me the specific number of officers in each, but is that, uh, are those two units units where you're constantly looking at additional officers into these specialty units, or is there a maximum that you have already achieved? How does that work? I really can't say whether okay. we're seeking to expand those units. I can tell okay. you that they're used in very specialized circumstances um, and they respond, when they respond, they respond well. Um, I can't tell you whether the department is seeking to expand them. Okay. I can tell you that we have 465 in ESU and 120 in the hostage negotiation team. Okay. Well, I guess I, I do know, I, I have a, a couple of officers that are in ESU, so I've known that this is the unit, the A-team, that does the search warrant executions, um, individuals who obviously barricaded. Uh, we've had many New Yorkers and calls that come in of individuals that are threatening to jump off of bridges mm -hmm. and train stations and subway stations, et cetera. So those are the instances that I personally know of where ESU has been dispatched um, because it is a specialty unit that has the skill set to really uh, de-escalate and, and you know, obviously get that individual uh, down off of that that elevated level. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition, that's why I asked the question because well, 465 is a, examples of CIT trained and non-CIT trained officers who had been helpful in similar circumstances got resolved it. before ASU even got there. Right. Okay. And speaking of which, um, do you have a, a recording of the response time of ESU that, um, in terms of them getting to the scene, because you just said that because of the CIT training, there could be instances where a patrol officer, CIT trained, can de-escalate that situation before ESU even arrives upon the scene. Mm -hmm. Do you know what an average response time is for ESU? I don't. I don't. Okay. And I wanted to ask about, uh, we had previous conversations, uh, 
about a year and a half ago about mental health diversion centers. And we were looking at sites in northern Manhattan where individuals could essentially go to these locations, um, obviously, instead of going into police custody and or hospitalization. Um, do we have an update on where we are with the mental health diversion centers? Yes, yeah, so as you know, there's, we've been able to announce finally two vendors, uh, Samaritan Daytop Village and Project uh, Renewal, who will be oh, okay. uh, respectively uh, managing each of the first of two, hopefully of more diversion centers. Um, and we hope to have both um, operating uh, in, uh, by the end of 2018, um, and who should, in combination, have a capacity to see about 2,500 people uh, a year. How many people? About 2,500, 2,500. 2,500 a year. So with Samaritan and Project Renewal as the two vendors, are we looking at two sites where Correct. each of them would operate? Two distinct sites, two distinct boroughs, likely. Okay. No further details on location. We're close to getting sites, but they aren't, as I've learned, once <laughs> I speak, when it's past tense. We try uh, to move fast. Yeah. Okay. I do remember the last time we talked about this before vendors were announced, um, the challenge that we had is obviously it would be a small setting. So the location we were looking at, I believe the capacity was obviously no more than maybe two dozen, 25 to 30 individuals. Is that still the case or are we looking at a, a larger capacity for these locations? I mean, we're est the volume we've estimated is, is sort of the volume that um, we think is uh, comfortable to um, put out there uh, and we'll learn over time what, what we can do, what we need for capacity and how we can use the existing staffing we have to optimize capacity, but that's our projection. Okay, okay, so we'll keep talking about that as we move forward. Um, I guess my, my last question before I turn it over to my chair again is because we have such an abundance of services from Thrive NYC, the Behavioral Task Force, NYC Safe, Healing NYC, the Crisis Intervention Training, the Co-Response Teams, DOHMH, NYPD, the list goes on and on and on. Um, what is it that we can do as a city council to be more helpful to obviously continue to improve and expand the capacity of the department to make sure that safety agents, uh, civilians, members of service, all of the community-driven units like NCOs are obviously trained. What is it that we can do? Where are you finding that you have gaps in services and how can we as a council work with you to be more helpful? That was a loaded question. Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> and I probably forgot an agency, I'm sure. It's, it's a big question. Um, if you're asking for a, a wish list, I would say that um, I would imagine that when we establish this working group and you have agencies challenging themselves and others to think about what everybody can do to contribute to um, solutions to this issue, that there will be new needs that arise. And okay. we should be paying attention to those, whether it means um, staffing more co-response teams, funding more officers, funding more um, clinicians to partner with us, whether it means um, building the capacity of other agencies to provide um, attention at various other stages of the process, that's what's going to emerge. Okay. And, and, and I, 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 I agree. I'm sorry. I, I just want to, I want to appreciate um, your specifying the spectrum of, mm -hmm. of resources we now have uh, to both reach people upstream before they ever need to call 911 and, and to make 911 yes. less of a way that people in distress try to find help that we can actually build a system that reaches them earlier. Um, but when that is the way they engage the system, that we make sure, as Councilman Williams met, uh, described, uh, a, mental health a mental health crisis should get a mental health response. And I think we want that to happen. So uh, what our challenge of all those um, new resources, and welcome to my world, is how do we um, not just have them um, operate, but really uh, combined for impact mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, impact on this group of people is a priority and it needs all hands in to uh, connect the dots and so that's why we both welcome the working group and uh, idea and uh, look forward to thinking concretely right. about how we look more comprehensively uh, not just about our two systems but many other systems mm -hmm. uh, where are the hospitals in this conversation where's 
or the insurance companies in the conversation? Where is, how do we really knit together the system that we're trying to build now that we have a lot more reach um, through Thrive and other efforts? Okay, no, I agree and I appreciate it. What I, I think is very unique about this administration and what we're doing with the multi-level agency partnership is we're actually looking at a lot of this from a mental health and a health perspective and not necessarily a criminal justice lens. Working with the NYPD and mental health professionals, we're looking at individuals and the health needs that they necessarily you know, have and that they need. Um, and I appreciate that, certainly on behalf of my district in the Bronx, that f faces a tremendous amount of challenge. It's not easy. And so I agree. I mean, welcome to our world as well, where we get the calls from mothers and fathers and parents that are in distress because their children and loved one needs help and they don't know where to go. And so to the best that we can, this is where we have public service campaigns and announcements. Um, certainly the toll-free 1-800-NYC-THRIVE, NYC Well, I know them by heart because these are numbers where you can get access to people 24 hours and it's not, you know, leave a message and wait for a return phone call. People need immediately help, uh, immediate help and we simply don't have the time to waste. So I appreciate the efforts and certainly want to thank Councilmember Williams for his idea of coming forth with a working group. Um, I think it's great to bring all of these minds together as well as you know, obviously those that are affected by this. Um, and it could have been a negative impact in bringing those voices to the table as well to understand how we can do our jobs obviously much more efficiently and better. So I thank you for that. And our communities. Uh, our advisory board has, and the CIT evolution has tremendously benefited from community input, as has Thrive. Uh, much of it came from community input. And uh, I think the solutions we're talking about have to have that voice at the table as well. Thank you. Chair? Thank you, Chair. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm reminded, I, I used to teach at John Jay, and I would always uh, give the kids my two cents of advice is become a court officer, because it's just the profound difficulty and challenges faced by NYPD. It's, and, and I think it really is, you know, it's worth repeating again that, you know, out of 160,000 EDP calls that, you know, that 1% involve use of force is really is a testament to mm -hmm. the professionalism of the of the force, but the but really the challenges you know are, are profound, you know. Uh, and again, I, I was just sort of curious. And again, legal issues aside, like, would it be? Do you think that you could keep officers safer and New Yorkers safer if you knew about people who, in in precincts, who were on antipsychotic medicine, and maybe you had a history of going on and off antipsychotic medicine? and you knew who those people were, do you think that you would be able to respond to those two instances in a way that would keep your officer safer and New Yorker safer? So there, there are really two parts to that question I'd like to answer, and then I'd like Dr. Belkin to take it as well. It's very helpful for officers to know the mental health history and the criminal justice history of anyone when they respond. And when we have an EDP call, we are now giving officers the history of that location before they arrive. And they know that we have responded before, that there's been an aided form created, that this person, they know whatever information we have in our records about that person or that location. It's very common, though, when we get a 911 call that we don't have even a name of someone. So we may have a location or we may have someone's out on the corner, or we may have someone, I hear something in the apartment or the hallway upstairs, I have no idea who it is. So it's very hard to give that history when we don't have a name, and it's very common that we don't have a name. When we do have names, we are trying to push out that information, that history, or the history of the location to the officer before they respond. Separate from that, though, you're really asking a question about would the city be safer if we had a system where uh, we knew when someone who is problematic when they're off their medication? Would the city be safer? And that is so much more a health system question and concern than it is a police department concern, um, how the health system can track people and intervene and try and get them reconnected to services. We are doing that with co-response, which is why I'm taking, we are doing that, 
right? So we're doing that with our co-response teams. That's our involvement where we think the reason why this person may be acting in this problematic way might be because they're not connected to the services that they had before. But let's, let's just have that in mind when we approach them. Let's assess the situation. Let's connect them to the most appropriate services that we can. And that's what we're doing through our co-response teams. But a sort of writ large, a you know, take it to scale, know everybody in the city. Dr. Belkin? I, I like how your question started with the phrase, legal issues aside. <laughs> right. Well, um, <laughs> right. uh, which, is a, which is an issue here. But I think the driving issue is that a police solution to people falling out of treatment is not a solution to people mm -hmm. falling out of treatment. Right. And, and so a lot of, uh, and I know this isn't a, a hearing about, about Thrive NYC and other efforts of the health department to try to close those gaps. But that's where, that's where our attention mm -hmm. uh, is at. We think it's a failure of that system if anyone has to engage a police officer mm -hmm. as their solution to falling out of care. Um, so, so, we want to fix, so we want to fix that. There are opportunities when contact with police happens to get people back into care, and that's, and that's what we're working on, right. uh, working on together. One example of doing exactly what you're saying, of knowing when somebody who has a really high risk if they stop their medications has stopped their medications, is AOT, um, which is at higher levels than ever and uh, has been very effective. NYC uh, SAFE has built on that um, by uh, a, lo a lot of the attention of NYC SAFE has been on the new treatment options, but we also have created a group that works with providers who are treating these, these folks that we've reconnected to care to really review with them and be partners with them uh, in terms of how they keep those people uh, in care. And that's been uh, very successful so far. Um, I think currently we have about 380 individuals uh, in that very focused tracking, people who've, who've, who there has been an act of violence in the context of mental illness. Um, and uh, for those in the community, over 90% stay in treatment, have stayed in treatment, uh, and have not um, committed another uh, violent offense, so, or have not committed uh, another act of violence that we know of, which is, uh, I just want to say, is astounding. Uh, so we can do this. We can build in other opportunities where care, rather than criminal justice, is the path for people, uh, and that's what and that's what we're uh, intending to do more of. But it does mean partnering with NYPD to to use that opportunity of 160,000 contacts uh, to try to make better outcomes out of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Obviously, that you know, as the chair of the mental health committee, I'd like to see people treated with you know who have mental health issues be treated as a health issue and not as a criminal justice issue. Uh, but I also, you know, and again. The, it's unfortunate that the exception to the rule is the thing that that gets the headlines, and and you know, and obviously there have been some you know profound tragedies where things have not gone the way we would like them to go. And like I, I was thinking of even in in this scenario, Councilmember Williams was talking about like if I was the caregiver of somebody who had a history of going on and off their medication, I might want to notify the precinct that like, you know, if if we call like. You know, my son or daughter is, you know, I want this. I, I want help. I don't want a tragedy. And and sort of like, I mean, maybe even like I said, people voluntarily telling people just, again, to give everybody the best chance of having an outcome that's that's helpful. Yeah, and, and I think uh, if the necessity of that call arises, uh, we want our officers to be best prepared to respond in a safe, effective way. But we especially want different calls to happen before that. Right. Um, and we put that in, we've started to put that in place. Uh, um, there have been several mentions of NYC Well, um, which uh, is not just a, a phone call assist, but we can connect people to appointments. We've connected thousands of New Yorkers to, to care. We stay on the phone with them if they want to make that appointment. And we can dispatch Mobile Crisis, which is a mental health only uh, team. Uh, and we do that now about on the, at the rate of about 20,000 times per year through NYC Well, and we're trying to explore things like can we, is there an opportunity for more 911 calls to go that route rather than this route? And there are a lot of issues involved in doing that, but that's, that's where, we're, where our head is at. I guess just, to, and I'll wrap it up, but like, would, 
does the precinct have any capacity to process that information? If I if I came to you and said I was the caregiver of someone who, uh, you know, I, I have a, an ad adult child who, I, you know, we try diligently to make sure that, that that person takes the medication, but it's not, it's imperfect. And currently, no, we don't have the capacity currently to process that. We do have the capacity to make um, wellness checks, which we do. If we have a parent calling and saying, I haven't heard from somebody in a long time, and I think I'm worried that they're in their apartment and something might be wrong, we do check on people like that, but no. Do you Co-response could. Yes. Do you but think though the capacity uh, that, that that having a, some methodology in a precinct where they, if someone like I said, wants to pre-notify you that uh, of again, I mean, like we'd I, be happy to look at it, and it's okay. it's a it's a topic that we can explore. Okay, and just to follow up on Dr. Belkin's point, uh, when when someone calls nine one one, like. When, how do we determine whether it's an EMT response or uh, you know, primarily a medical response, response versus an NYPD response? So when com someone calls 911, we ask where's the emergency, and if we get the impression that there's something urgent and that there's danger involved, and that's typically, that's what these calls are that we call EDP calls. It's not anyone who may have a mental health problem. It's someone who we think might be in danger to themselves or others. That's what we're calling an EDP call. That's what the 160,000 are. So anytime we determine that there might be someone in danger, um, that's an NYPD urgent response as well as EMS. And ESU is right behind them. And remember that everyone in ESU is also an EMT. Uh, I don't want to pat ourselves in the back, but I found this to, to be very, very interesting. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Quick question, uh, Deputy Commissioner, just on what you just talked about. the Is every 911 call with a person in emotional distress categorized as an EDP, or do you have another category of other cases where the response isn't the person is a threat to themselves or someone else. How does that work? It's very interesting. Is every call we classified? Have, we have a lot of 911 calls that don't require urgent response. And okay. That's what 311 is about, and that's what okay. New York City Well is about. And if we believe that um, this isn't something that is appropriate for police response at all, we'll refer it to somebody else. Okay, so those calls are not recorded under the 160 that no, we're talking about. No, okay. and it's also true that of the 160, there's a large percentage where they're referred to EMS, or EMS just sort of, some, there's voluntary compliance. Do you want to go to a hospital? Can we get you to go to the hospital? Um, someone says, of course, EMS is perfectly comfortable taking that person to the hospital on their own, and, and they do. Okay. That's part of the 160. Right. Okay. So the 911 call taker, obviously, based on their training, makes a distinction on dispatching it to PD and EMS or whether there are other services that they are potentially referred to that are not police related. Is that what you're saying? Yes, as in all 911 calls. Okay. And okay. I, I don't, I, I don't. I don't want to. So I guess what I'm asking is, would the caller things, know that? So if I call 911 and they determine. You should be calling New York City well, and that's what's being promoted okay. extensively if this isn't an emergency and you're someone who needs services. But typically, at this point, with a city that has 311 and now has New York City well, if someone calls 911, typically they are signaling, I need help now. Something is happening now. Right. That's, that's, that's what a, I understand. That's the NYPD response. Okay. No, no. That's, that's what I understand. Urgency. I just yeah. want to make it clear. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility of the 911 call taker that gets the first mm -hmm. initial call it's to tremendous. assess if it's really an emergency or, ma'am or sir, this is not an emergency. You can call 311 or NYC well. Right. That's and when someone is talking about a mental health problem, we err always on the side of there might be danger involved and we're right. there. Okay. We're there. 
Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Williams for a final question. Oh, uh, thank you. Not a final question. Statement. I just want to uh, thank again and Dr. Belkin, thank you for uh, that. One of your last comments with uh, us considering it a failure if they're reaching out to the police department. It's a failure of the system if they're reaching out to the police department uh, to get the services they may have needed before, which I think further indicates what all of us have been saying. Uh, the weight that's put on the police department uh, needs to be lifted a little bit so that we respond differently. Maybe um, um, maybe we have to have a, another system for folks to call besides 911 to help trigger uh, another kind of response. Maybe that's something the working group uh, can um, talk about. And I just wanted to mention, I know I've spoken to the commissioner about this extensively, and I too believe that he wants to try to figure out uh, ways to do things differently. I thank him for that. Last point I wanted to make, my hope is with the working group uh, obviously be made up of a plethora of people, not just the police department, but advocates, and also hopefully uh, people who have dealt with this themselves and are uh, involved in the mental health system and have gone through crisis as well, because very often we leave the people who are uh, most personally involved off of these type of uh, task forces and their voices uh, sometimes are the best. Whoever's closest to the problem sometimes has the best solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Williams. And I guess my final remarks are we appreciate your presence and your partnership in the work you're doing. Um, there is a tremendous amount of work that we obviously continue um, to be done, and this city council is certainly committed. This is the first time in quite some time since we rolled out CIT that the committee has had a chance and an opportunity to delve a little bit further into CIT to understand the curriculum, the training, the guidelines, the protocols, the partnership, the commitment, the data daily response, I mean, everything that's really done. But I certainly want to thank you and thank the men and women of the NYPD, as well as all of the public servants in DOHMH. Um, your work has not gone unnoticed. Um, it's a tremendous testament to the commitment that we have as public servants to make sure that we're constantly looking at creative and innovative ways of doing our jobs better and making sure that we keep everyone safe in this city. So I want to thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Belkin, and thank you, Lieutenant for being here and we look forward to working with you and I know all of the executives that are here from the NYPD as well Deputy Commissioner Tracy Kesey thank you very much for being here and uh, we look forward to working with you thank you okay thank you okay and as you leave uh, we do have other panels that are coming up so certainly we ask if someone from the NYPD and DOHMH could remain behind, that would be deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. Our next panel is Paul Capafari, Chief Assistant District Attorney for Richmond County. Our good friend, District Attorney Michael McMahon. Thank you so much. Yes. If there's anyone here that has not signed up to testify before the committee, please make sure you do so with the sergeant at arms on your right. Uh, we are happy to entertain further testimony. We do have a few more panels before the committee, but if you have not signed up yet, please do so at the sergeant at arms. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You may begin on behalf of the district attorney. Thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm Paul Capafari, the chief assistant DA on uh, Staten Island. Uh, I'm also a member of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And like so many NAMI members, it was when my son went into the psych ward. He's been, uh, been there a few times. I just want to emphasize to the committee that CIT is not training. It's a crisis intervention team, and in the Memphis model, when there's a 911 call, the CIT responds. It's a separate team that responds to all calls for EDPs. Training is great. All the officers should have training, but training is rounded out by experience. So if you have this training, you're on a team, you respond to all calls for EDPs, your training is enhanced. Your experience develops you, 
and I would simply emphasize that to the committee. Um, the New York City Police Department has often said they're too big, too diverse, that the dispatch can't handle it. We're offering up Staten Island a discrete population. We've got our own dispatch, our own four precincts. Why don't we try the real Memphis CIT model on Staten Island, where when the call comes in, as Council Member Williams was, was trying to drive in, Right now, it just goes to sector whiskey. You respond. If it's a call for an EDP, we should be sending the crisis intervention team, not looking for who's been trained. Have a separate team that's ready to respond, and it's those police officers that respond. So I guess that's the essence of my testimony. CIT, as you, you've said, crisis intervention team. That's who needs to respond to these EDP calls. Really appreciate the, as a father of someone who's been in the hospital, and actually I have another son who's a New York City police officer, so I appreciate the focus that you're placing on this to provide for the safety of our citizens and the safety of our police officers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. Can you cited the Memphis model? You indicated that in Staten Island, the 120, the 121, 122, 123, four precincts, I know Chief Delatory well, you guys have your own CIT, crisis intervention team. So when a 911 call comes in and it's a Staten Island call, how are, you know, how are those calls different from the others that we get in the system for the other four boroughs? Because you're saying that in Staten Island, a 911 call that's an EDP-related call, the police get it, but when they go out and respond, they have a team of civilians that try no, to No, no, no. This is uh, the CIT, the crisis intervention team, are police officers. And that's what they do. They respond to the calls for EDPs. We don't have that. We oh, want that. Oh, okay. So you're just saying it's a team. Okay, yes. I understand. Okay. So I who responds, as, as Council Member Williams okay. asked, who responds? Right now, Got it. the closest sector responds. Yes. And if they happen to be CIT right. trained, good. I think we need a separate team. They respond to all these calls. Okay. I think we were talking about that with the CRTs that we have where we're working with, again, it's, it's preventative more than it is reactionary because these are identified individuals that may have a mental health illness or they're in a crisis that we've already identified and we can obviously work with them to address their issues, you know, divert them to a number of services, but it really doesn't play to what many have reached out to us about when officers respond, patrol officers, I'm saying, in their sector, they would have someone that has a mental health um, profession that would also travel with them. That's what you're talking about. Or in that that respect. is the team that always responds. So they always have the experience and they get to know and they've been there before. You could have CIT training that the police are providing and you could go months before you get called on an EDP. And how do you respond? The more often you respond to these kind of calls, the better you're going to get at it. Okay. Got it. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about, well, it's kind of similar, the HOPE program that you have in Staten Island? Oh, the HOPE program so, has been spectacularly okay. successful, <laughs> way more than I anticipated in that we've had about uh, 300 people arrested for 220.03, which is uh, uh, drugs, and they get a desk appearance ticket. Normally, your desk appearance ticket, you come back to court 30 days. We say for a 220.03, you have seven days, but if you go to a resource center to be assessed, you don't have to come and see the judge, and if you get meaningfully engaged in some kind of treatment, whatever the treatment professionals say, we decline to prosecute. Uh, we've declined to prosecute about 90%. The people follow through and get meaningfully engaged. Mm -hmm. And so there's really, so far this year, about 250 people that never come in to see the judge. 
Their case is we declined to prosecute because they got meaningfully engaged. A desk appearance ticket is usually your first arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, however you want to put it, a wake-up call, a slap in the face. You've been arrested now. What are you going to do? You're going to go to see the judge, or how about going to this resource center? Tremendous support from the Legal Aid Society. Uh, tremendous support from the providers on Staten Island. Right. And it's a way to divert people. One of the groups that we spoke to when we formed the HOPE program were recovering addicts. What do you guys think about this? And most of them were, get me into the resource center. I'll see that those are real people who really care about me. I might blow them off, I might blow them off a couple of times, but eventually, when I'm ready for treatment, I'll know where to go, and I'll know there are real people there who are gonna help me. So it, uh, I, the HOPE program has been spectacularly right. successful. We were up in the Bronx talking about it. It's scalability, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, we're gonna have 600 desk appearance tickets for 22003 in this year. The Bronx is going to have 6,000. Can they scale this up? Which is always uh, the thing with uh, Staten Island. You know, we're so much smaller uh, than the other boroughs, but so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I well, we appreciate the support <laughs> we've gotten from the city council and the NYPD and Legal Aid. The whole right. program is working. Thank no, you. No, no, I've heard of its great success, and I know Bronx and other uh, counties are looking at it. What I wanted to ask specifically, and the reason I brought it up, is because the whole program obviously focuses on individuals that have a substance abuse or some sort of an addiction. But is there a way that you think that possibly we could look at a similar model for individuals that have a mental illness? Yes, we've been, we've been like toying with that. What what happens, though, is frequently you have a victim. Uh, the person with mental illness acts out by breaking something or um, hurting someone. And yes, we have a mental health court. Um, that's a big uh, step forward. Uh, ours was modeled after Brooklyn. Brooklyn was very helpful in helping us set that up. And we have about the same percentage of people but once again, to get into mental health court frequently, well, almost always requires the cooperation of a victim. And that's okay. uh, always problematic. Okay. Thank you. I definitely want to keep talking about that um, just in terms of the whole program and looking at it from a different perspective. Because um, I think that it's shown tremendous success in Staten Island. And obviously, uh, a lot of this really came out of the world of the opioid crisis that we've been dealing with and the systemic, obviously, patterns in Staten Island and Bronx um, and the just the population's different but still similar challenges and you know your DA has been working very closely with my DA on that so I would love to see if we can talk further um, moving into the next budget season about how a whole program could possibly work for those that have a mental illness. I think at this point we have to obviously look at all options and look at successful models and how that can translate to another population that is in equal need of assistance. Well, in talking about models, we would love to be a model on Staten Island where uh, a crisis intervention team, not just a patrol officer who happens mm -hmm. to be in a sector, a crisis intervention team responds to all the EDP calls. Maybe it could be a success like the HOPE program, and then we could scale it up to other places in the city. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for coming, and please extend our warmest regards to the district attorney. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. Thank, Thank you. you for coming today. Thank you.
Our next panel calling to the front is Sanford Rubenstein, attorney at law, Charlene Thomas, family of Dwayne June, Paulette Presley, representing Devante Presley family, and Amy Ramar, attorney at law. Okay. Okay, everyone's here. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate your presence, and you may begin. Just so the record of this public hearing is clear, there have been at least five deaths of mentally ill people at the hands of the NYPD in this city in the last five months, in the last 11 months. I presently represent four families of mentally ill persons killed by police in New York City within the last eight months. James Owens, Dwayne June, whose niece is sitting next to me, he'll testify next, Ariel Galarza, and Erickson Brito. If you add to those four deaths the killing of Deborah Danner, by a police officer in the Bronx. That makes five mentally ill people killed by the NYPD in the last 11 months. As of late July 2017, only 16% of NYPD officers were trained in how to handle cases involving the emotionally disturbed. Certainly, as this panel agrees, it should be 100%. We learned today that while officers, sergeants, and lieutenants are being trained, there's no training ongoing of patrol officers, those who actually go on site and deal with emotionally disturbed people. At present, they're not, no additional training is ongoing. The training must be accelerated. Certainly, I'm sorry, just as important, we desperately need a task force now of experts to address this problem to look at the protocol that presently exists to determine how police training can be improved and what other measures can be enacted to prevent these deadly confrontations between the mentally and police in this city. In addition, this task force has to look at why present protocol is not properly fired by police, is not properly followed by police who respond to 911 calls involving the mentally ill, and particularly while police not trained in dealing with the emotionally ill, fail to call emergency services personnel who are trained in that fashion when they are needed. The creation of this task force to make recommendations for a complete overhaul of the way police interact with the mentally ill is long overdue. An independent task force must be created to specifically address this issue. And if it is a broader task force, then certainly this must be a significant component of it. The killings of the mentally ill in this city must stop. Sean? Yes, you can all go. Explain. Are you ready? Just make sure your microphone is on. Thank you, Mr. Rubenstein. Hi, my name is Charlene Thomas, and I am the cousin of the late Delane June. I'm a little nervous. Um, so it's never easy to lose a loved one. As a parent, we hope that your children would outlive you. It's not only unfortunate, but it's difficult as a mother to have to bury your youngest child. It is even more difficult when you know that his death could have been avoided. How can you sleep at night? How can you move forward when you watch your child be murdered by the people you call to help him? That's the nightmare that my aunt is living. It has been a little over a month since Dwayne was killed, and my family is still trying to wrap our heads around this tragedy. The worst part in all of this is that Dwayne's killing is something that happens way too often. When did protect and serve turn into shoot and kill? How many more mothers have to bury their children before we get some kind of reform? How many more marches should we have? How many more vigils should we hold? How many more city council meetings should we call? Who is going to protect us as citizens and who's going to protect our children? I am here because I want to plead with this city council community to create a task force to evoke change with how the police department handles calls involved with mentally ill individuals. We believe that all 34,450 NYPD officers should receive 
Crisis Intervention Team Training, or CIT training. This should be high on the priority list. We are asking that a special task force be put together to supervise how these calls are handled so that we do not have the same outcome as we've had. We know that nothing can or will ever bring Dwayne back. It is a harsh reality that we have to live with and we are trying to cope with every day. However, it's harder when we know that more could have been done to prevent this from happening. Had all of these officers been properly trained, my cousin may be alive today. Matthew 5.30 says, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. There needs to be reform with the police department and within our justice system. There needs to be an overhaul in the protocols on how to approach and deal with individuals who are mentally ill or emotionally disturbed. Distress calls for help should not end with families watching their loved ones die at the hands of the police. Change is a must. Another family should not have to deal with this avoidable tragedy or live with this nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, okay. everyone. Okay, you're not speaking? Okay. I'll speak first. Oh, okay, sure, no problem. But that's okay. <laughs> yes. It's not on? Make sure the red light's yes, on. Yes, it's on okay, now. Sorry about that. My name is Amy Romo. I'm an attorney. I represent a young man by the name of Devontae Presley, who was shot by the police in Brooklyn in October of last year. I'm here with his mother, Miss Presley, who I think has a lot to contribute to this discourse. Um, I won't take too long, but I'd like to say that I agree whole, wholeheartedly with what Mr. Rubenstein and the, the young woman who spoke, uh, the uh, relative of Mr. Jeune, has said thus far, that training is absolutely crucial. And at this point, I'll allow Ms. Um, Presley to uh, hello, um, speak with you. Hello, everyone. I'm the mother of Devante Presley. My name is Ms. Presley, Paulette Presley. My son, Devante, he is 24 years old. He's a poet. He's a songwriter. He's bright. In fact, he was supposed to get promoted when he was in ninth grade, but he turned it down. He wanted to be with his friends. Uh, my son, he writes music, and he was doing it for years. He's very talented. What happened to my son is that he has a psychiatric problem. It happened when he got older, um, but he needs help. What he did not need were bullets. That officer, Miguel Gonzalez, shot into his body, nearly killing him. Officer Gonzalez had no training, no CIT training. My son was on that operating table for 19 hours nine different surgeons, I prayed. My son told me he felt me pray. He felt me in the room with him. For 19 hours, I never left that hospital. Even when the cops told me I couldn't even go in the hospital room after surgery to spend time with my son, I fought every day to go in that hospital room to be near my son. Now, I don't know, my heart goes out to you and your family. I thank God my son is still here because he could have been gone. And I just want something to happen for everyone to get on the same page. When we call for our family to get help, we're not looking for our family to be put in a body bag. We're not looking for our family to, for us to be mourning. And it's just, I don't understand. My whole thing is, is that um, the man that shot and killed Mr. John is the same man that shot and my son survived, but my son could have been dead. So I don't understand why is he still 
a police officer. I don't understand why he didn't get the training after he shot my son. That could have been avoided with him. How could he still feel that he could go in any home anywhere and still pull a trigger on anyone? Heck, he could have used pepper spray, anything, wild bullet. My son got shot three times. My son would never be the same. It went through his intestines. They shot him twice in his, he shot him twice in his arm and once in his abdomen. Now my son, he, he is not the same, just put it like that. He'll never be the same. He's 24 years old. So um, I don't understand. Um, I was, how many people, how many more people have to be killed before we come to a, a conclusion of what's going to happen with this police officer? Is he still working? I mean, is he going to ever work again? Is he going to be, is he going to have um, training now? What's going to happen? That's what I need to know. Is he going to still work? These are questions that need to be answered because we can't have another another killing. We can't have another... Uh, it's just... I don't understand it. I really don't. I'm sorry. I'm emotional. Y'all forgive me, but my son would never be the same. He would never be the same. Thank you very much to each of you for being here, for your courage, for your bravery. Um, I appreciate you being here to tell the story of your loved one, of your son, Devante, yes. who lived. Praise God. Praise God. And I'm, I'm thankful that you're here on behalf of your relative, of Dwayne, and I'm truly sorry. Um, this committee, we extend our thoughts and prayers to the both of you. Um, because it's not easy to sit here and tell your story. It's not easy to go on record, but you recognize that through your pain, you can be a support for someone else. And the work that we are doing and with, you know, the conversations of a task force and making sure that this police department gets to 100%. Um, I, I see the number that you have, Mr. Rubenstein, of 16, and certainly that's not acceptable to anyone. Yes. And we have to do better. We have to continue to make sure that every single officer that wears a uniform is trained in CIT. But also, as we've been talking about the collaboration um, the police respond to all of these calls, but it's not their sole responsibility. We have to have the mental health and the health experts that are a part of this conversation that have the expertise. We want to make sure that we continue to look at this through the lens from a health perspective and not criminal justice. And that's always been our challenge and our continuous struggle to really find the delicate balance that we need. Um, so I appreciate you coming today, and I know it is not easy. Um, you are here represented by your attorneys, but I know that there are so many other stories out there that we probably have not heard of. Yeah. And so I appreciate you, and I encourage you to continue to hold on. Mm -hmm. Find something to hold on to, because it will not be easy. But if you can be a source of encouragement for others and be a part of the conversations that we're having as elected officials, as advocates, we don't know it all. But that's why we assemble yeah. teams and partnerships to come together yeah. because we have the same purpose and we have the same common beliefs that everyone has a fundamental responsibility in this city to be safe. We all have the responsibility, and we all have to be a part of the conversation. So I appreciate all of you coming. Um, Councilmember Williams does have uh, several remarks to, to give, and I want to give him that opportunity. And also want to recognize that we are joined by our colleague, Councilmember Heim Deutsch, as well as we were joined earlier by Councilmember James Vaca and Councilmember uh, Rafael Espinal. Thank you once again, Councilmember Williams. May I say something else, please? Oh, sure, absolutely. Make sure um, your mic is on. It's on. Um, the Truly. police department representative that was here uh, mentioned something about the, the 911 calls that come in, um, and they're usually classified as criminal or whatever the police is dispatched. And um, that kind of disturbed me because 
the 911 call that my aunt made, she specifically said that Dwayne was nonviolent, that they did not feel threatened, that he was just acting a bit strange, and she wanted him to go to the hospital to get his medication, as she's previously done several other times. So this particular precinct was familiar with my cousin. And it's very troubling to us that this is, that was the end result of that call. Um, we believe that the officer that was on scene should not have been on scene, but if someone calls and says that this person is nonviolent, they specifically ask, did he have a weapon, in which she responded no. Do you feel that you were in danger? She responded no. Why wasn't this dispatched to the other organizations that they mentioned? Why was this dispatched to NYPD? So I think that that needs to be addressed as well, that if someone is not in any imminent danger, as she said, NYPD should not respond. And if you were saying that, oh, there's going to be a supervisor that's CIT trained, I don't think that that's enough because according to the police reports, there were three officers that were CIT trained, and yet my cousin was still shot five times and was killed. So that's not enough, and that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very painful. I'm a mom of a five-year-old little boy, and <coughs> what do I tell him? What do I tell him? I'm so glad that he was not here when this happened because I don't know what I would explain to him about what happened to Dwayne. I don't want this to happen to another family. Exactly. This should not happen to another family. This needs to be addressed now and it needs to be fixed now. Not in 2018, not in 2023, because this is happening now. now. That's right. Thank you very much. And I will just say um, that during the course of today's hearing, we talked about the code response teams, where, if, as you indicated, if there were previous calls made to 911 of any individual with a mental illness that was perceived and categorized as nonviolent, these code response teams are in place. And obviously, we have to talk more about the effectiveness and the efficiency of what the code response team looks like. It's not just PD, but mental health professionals that are part of these teams, but how can we utilize them to enhance their services and real responses so that individuals can get the assistance that they're needed, but also with every 911 call that comes into the system and the call taker does their assessment and determines NYPD is, is contacted and dispatched as well as EMS. And that's something we have to obviously make sure is happening in every single instance. So um, I appreciate you raising those issues and those points. We hear you and those are the things that we are obviously asking and demanding as well because we do wanna make sure if we can avoid the pain of any other parent, any other loved one that has to face the pain that both of you feel each day, then obviously we, we seek to do that and we want to strive to do that. So I thank you for raising those points. Ms. Chairperson, if I may briefly, sure. on behalf of my client, Devante Presley, I do want to thank you, uh, Councilperson Williams and others here for holding these hearings. These discussions are absolutely crucial in any attempt at resolving and improving community uh, relations with the police in the city. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the attorneys for being here and obviously the family members. I know it's hard. I often am I'm, I'm amazed at the strength that the families have after this to keep going and particularly those that choose to use the pain uh, into purpose. Uh, I do want to make sure we put on the record that um, there was another family. F thankfully, um, they were not injured, but the family next to uh, the June family, the bullet went through the hole. And uh, thankfully, the young lady, the young teenager, was not in the kitchen when the bullet came through and was mm. in her room. But the water that she was drinking did get hit. And so uh, there are a lot of things that can happen as a result of, of these things. And I want to make sure we uplift that family as well because they are, they are, they are traumatized. <sighs> what was said here, I mean, it, it all makes sense. And uh, Ms. Thomas, thank you uh, for pointing some things out. I think one of the critical things is the fact that when it goes to 911, the response is that of uh, what would happen if someone called for a crime being committed. And we have to find a way 
for that. The response is not that of a crime being committed, but that of someone who is uh, needs some mental health attention. And I, I wish we had that answer before uh, Mr. Presley was shot, and I wish we had that answer before Mr. June was killed. And we didn't, and I think we failed. And my hope is that we will soon not fail any longer, and hopefully, you know, uh, sooner than later. What troubles me the most, just obviously between your two families, is that the officer that shot Mr. Presley was not trained. I don't understand why that didn't prompt someone saying perhaps we should train this officer who responded to an EDP call, end up shooting the person. Perhaps he should be trained in case he responds to another EDP call, which he ultimately did. I didn't really get any answer as to why that did not prompt Mr. Gonzalez to being trained. And as was mentioned, four people responded to Dwayne June's call, and the only person who shot someone was the person who shot Mr. Presley and was not trained. I believe that um, the administration, the police department, should answer that at some point to the families and to the community of why that was, and at minimum say there is corrective steps to be taken so that order of events doesn't happen again. That seems to be a simple fix. If someone's involved with the EDP in the shooting, it seems simple to say that person should be trained so that if it happens again, there's a better response. Or at minimum, perhaps they're not in the room when they're responding, that someone who has a training is taking the lead. And, and so- um, Excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, is he still working? My understanding is that he is still a police officer, and they are they are going under they are going through the normal procedures that are going under um, investigations. Um, they, the I don't know the, the legal, so you should have to find out. But um, more than likely, it will be shown that um, the protocols that were in place were followed. Uh, my contention is that the protocols that are in place are not the right ones and need to be changed. The attorney's office in Brooklyn does have a criminal investigation underway with regard to his actions in terms of the death okay. of uh, Mr. June. Okay. All right. Thank you again for all of uh, your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, God bless right. you. Bless you, too. Our next panel for today's hearing is Joshua Goldstein from the Legal Aid Society and Coalition for the Homeless, Joyce Kendrick of Brooklyn Defender Services, Ruth Lowenkrone from New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, Beth Horales from ACLU, and Carla Rabinowitz from CCIT NYC and Community Access. Did I get everyone? We have Joshua, Joyce, Ruth, Beth, and Carla. All right. Okay. I'm very partial to a panel of women, Joshua. <laughs> Four women, thank you. <laughs> if there's anyone here that still wants to provide testimony for the record, please make sure you see the Sergeant at Arms on your right. Thank you. You may begin, thanks. Uh, thank you, my name is Joshua Goldfein. I'm a staff attorney at the Homeless Rights Project of the Legal Aid Society and I'm here to present testimony on behalf of the, uh, both the civil and criminal practice of the Legal Aid Society, as well as Coalition for the Homeless, who we represent. Uh, and we've submitted uh, written testimony. I won't read it aloud. Um, I just want to summarize the key points. And in particular, I, I, uh, I know it's off topic, but I would be remiss if we did not thank the chair 
of her leadership on universal access to counsel uh, and housing court, uh, which is just rolling out now, will benefit all New Yorkers. Um, the population that uh, the Legal Aid Society and Coalition for the Homeless serve um, is uh, many, many, there are many members of that uh, cohort who pass through a revolving door from shelter system to criminal justice system to the mental health system. And uh, it's in that context that uh, we work with many clients who um, come into contact with criminal justice in the ways that have been discussed today. And in many of those interactions, uh, as has been mentioned by many of the speakers today, they have positive uh, interactions, but we also have um, significant, uh, observed significant problems with the way that the NYPD responds to people in distress, whether they're classified as emotionally disturbed persons or not. Um, we have uh, scheduled tomorrow a hearing, a fairness hearing, on a settlement that we just reached with the Department of Homeless Services about how they're going to respond to people with disabilities, including people with mental health disabilities. And as a result of that um, agreement, uh, the Department of Homeless Services will revise all of its procedures and will uh, have much uh, better ways of interacting with uh, people with mental health issues. And the NYPD um, should take the same steps to ensure that when uh, New Yorkers are in distress, when people need help, that what they get is help and not the kinds of responses that we've heard about uh, today when things have gone awry. Um, in particular, we just want to point out also that the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Investigation uh, issued a report on many of these issues and made recommendations, which included that there be a, a dedicated staff who respond to these kinds of situations, um, that the NYPD patrol guide be revised uh, so that the officers who haven't been trained, so that any officer can, can have guidance uh, in writing about how to deal with a particular situation. Um, and, in, and, and most importantly, perhaps, that the diversion efforts that were discussed today be expanded. Uh, when we hear that the drop-in centers are not going to be available until the end of 2018, um, you know, that's, that's not an acceptable response for the city of New York. Uh, if interim, if because of contracting uh, and procurement rules, uh, we understand that things take time, but, we, you know, in the meantime, incidents like the ones we've heard about will continue to occur. Um, and, of course, uh, the most important form of diversion is housing. And if people are, are housed, if the supportive housing that um, the city has agreed and the state has agreed to make available uh, is actually brought online, people will be off the streets, people will be in, in secure locations, and people will have access to the resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Council Members. My name is Joyce Kendrick. I am a supervising attorney of the Mental Health Unit at Brooklyn Defender Services, where I represent criminal defense clients in the Mental Health Treatment Court and in competency evaluation proceedings. Uh, first, we want to echo everything that Chief Assistant DA Capafari stated with respect to the need for a separate team that responds to each EDP call. Now, despite our participating in two mayoral initiatives on criminal justice and behavioral health under both Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor de Blasio in 2011 and 2014, we have seen little change on the ground as to how the NYPD responds to our clients in the midst of a mental health crisis. The January 2019 DOI report made it clear that those of us on the, what those of us on the ground already know, that the NYPD are ill-equipped to respond to mental health crises, as they, and they continue to respond all too frequently with unlawful or lethal force. Today we heard a statistic that only 1% of EDP responses result in the use of force. Based on what we see, we believe that this use of force statistics is underreported. I had a client uh, several years ago by the name of Natasha. Um, she was in her 30s. I met Natasha at Kings County Hospital when I went there for a bedside arraignment. Natasha had been shot in her stomach. When the police responded, 
to a radio call for an emotionally disturbed female where no re weapon was reported to be present. When the police arrived, they say that Natasha had her arm up and that she had a knife in her arm. They pepper sprayed her after asking her to get down on the ground and she did not get down on the ground as she was instructed. They then shot her in the stomach. When I met her, she was on a ventilator and she was in, in the hospital and could not even speak to me. It is stories like these that tell us that the things that we've heard about that have happened recently are not isolated. These things have happened in the past and continue to happen. As Dr. Belkin noted, care rather than a criminal justice response should be the path going forward. In my experience today, arrest still remains all too often the NYPD's response. As a supervisor at BDS's mental health unit, I primarily represent people with severe mental illness. We staff arraignments in Brooklyn, and I can tell you that there's rarely an arraignment that goes by that we don't see that mentally ill clients are brought through arraignments, they have been arrested and charged and brought through arraignments, even for simple things like criminal mischief, breaking a window here and there, instead of being taken to the hospital. It is clear here that there has been a failure of the city to end the unnecessary arrest of these people in crisis, as was the stated goal in the 2014 Behavioral Task Force. It is clear that the NYPD must do a better job at training all of its officers in crisis intervention. But there is much more that can be and should be done to prevent unnecessary and harmful police violence. We urge the council to look no further than the two recent mayoral initiatives and reports and recommendations that are cited in my written testimony. It's clear that the work has already been done. We've had several meetings. We've talked about this over and over. And we've identified the solutions to police violence against people with mental illness. But implementing these solutions requires political will. And it's here that we are asking you to put into place these reforms to stop the unnecessary arrests and deaths of New Yorkers in crisis. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Ruth Lohenkron. I'm the director of the Disability Justice Project at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We advocate on behalf of persons with mental disabilities as well as persons with other disabilities. And this is an issue that we are very concerned about. How are we as a society, I want to say, first most broadly and then uh, taking it more locally, how are we in New York City responding to people in mental health crisis? Um, I really appreciate that you are holding this hearing to uh, solicit opinions about how we're doing and what we could be doing better. I really appreciated the report. I will say as a little bit of a side note that we were disappointed that the hearing wasn't better publicized. We just got a hold of the report early this morning. I think there would be many more people giving input. And if there can be a way to continue to give you that input, at least in writing over the course of time, I think that would be good. And we can share that with some of the uh, coalition partners. My, my colleague, uh, Carla Rabinowitz, is going to talk about the coalition for CIT training, of which New York Lawyers is also a member. Um, and we could have more people providing input. Um, and I also just want to specifically praise the fact that both the report and your questions are really getting to the investigations of individuals who are shot and individuals who are killed. They are not numbers. Yes, we need to look at the bigger picture and look at a system that's in need of reform, but we also need to recognize that these are individuals who are being hurt, and I really appreciate the respect that this um, committee, these two committees, are, are giving to that. Um, I, I really would like to underscore 
I, I recognize that what we are talking about today is how the NYPD responds to people in mental health crisis, but it is so worth underscoring what Dr. Belkin said and what others said, which is this is an issue that should not even be in the province of the New York Police Department. Yes, we know there are going to be calls that involve the police department. And yes, we therefore need to talk about training, and I'll talk about that really briefly. But what we need to develop, and this is what I think when the council chair asks about what can the council do, I really think that we need to be pushing, and the council hopefully needs to be pushing, to establish these uh, diversion, it's almost a misnomer because I don't think anybody should be diverted from the police. Rather, that should be the place where people with mental health crises go. That should be where the parents and the family members call the mental health system that's going to be there to help them. And I think that's what we need to build and recognize and that what we're talking about today is really only secondary to that. But secondary it is or reality it is. So uh, my office firmly supports the kind of training that we have been talking about. But, and I, I really applaud the comment that you said, too little and not fast enough. Um, I paraphrase for sure. But that is our opinion too. We need to train the entire police force. We can't have another situation where you have three people who are CIT trained one person who's not CIT trained, and that is the person who does the shooting. That's not to say that there aren't going to be problems along the line, but at the very least, it shows us that everybody has to be CIT trained, not just a few. And I really would, would endorse what Mr. Williams, Council Member Williams also said about prioritizing how, how people are trained. So CIT training, too slow, too few, let's speed it up. Let's train everybody and let's make sure that the police department is on board because I heard little back and forth. Are they really planning to train everybody? Ultimately, that is what Commissioner Herman said, and that is absolutely what we think needs to happen. Um, we need to, in addition, recognize that we have to dispatch the mental health advocates, and I agree with my colleagues here that dispatching the teams with the experience is the way to do it when, in fact, the police need to be involved. Um, just want to close by saying that what's important is not only these kind of formal dialogues that we're having here, but actually in the community dialogues. You are so steeped in the community as council members. If you would sponsor for a where individuals, family members, advocates, academics, the police, where everyone can talk, I think that would be another great service that the council could play. And then, of course, funding. These programs take money, and I think that we have to recognize that lives are at stake and funding has to be following our recognitions. And I think ultimately, again, agreeing with many of my colleagues, that we have a 2014 task force that already put together a statement, a plan of action, and that is the task force that should be reconvened. Those are the guidelines that should be followed so we can move on this quickly, and that's, I think, the, the main operative word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Haroulis. I'm a senior staff attorney at the New York Civil Liberties Union. We've been working on CIT issues and police brutality, as you may be aware, for a very long time. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the name Eleanor Bumpers, but um, that was when our office first got involved with assessing exactly how the NYPD addresses people who are stigmatized uh, by virtue of their mental health disabilities. Um, we have been supportive. We are a member of the advisory group to the NYPD and DOHMH that you heard about today um, because we believe that CIT training is critical and essential for police officers. But we don't believe that this is the only outcome that should be sought here. CIT, as we heard from the DA from Staten Island and from my colleagues, is a program. It is a team. It calls for the integration of all 
agencies who are supposed to be providing services, whether it be mental health services, public protection services, housing services, and the like. Um, and what is going on at the NYPD is all fine and well in terms of training. Obviously, we believe that the entire staff should be trained. It needs to be rolled out more quickly. The 911 system needs to be assessed in a way that provides a meaningful response to people who are calling for help for an illness or a crisis who are not criminals, who are not expecting, as we heard earlier, to end up in a body bag for their family member. Um, the dispatch system is a major, major area that I think needs a lot of attention paid to. Um, moving forward, I think you need to also, and this is a funding question, insist on those diversion centers being established. Talking to the 2014 report of the task force, that task force, as you may recall, was set up in the wake of two horrific deaths of individuals with mental health issues at Rikers Island. Those recommendations are a continuum of approaches that the city needs to take in order to reduce the population at Rikers. Ultimately, we hear from the city that there's a plan to completely close the facility by 20 and 10 years. Um, but the population of individuals at Rikers who are deemed to have severe mental illness is up to 40%. None of those people should be there. They should be, quote, diverted, you know, diverted from the criminal justice system, provided services in the community. The task force appears to have fallen aside. You know, when you look back at the members, that task force comprised representatives from HRA, OMH probation, police department, ACS, corp council, fire department, OMB, veterans affairs, corrections, HHC, homeless services, and then New York State Department of Health, New York State Office of Mental Health, um, the New York State court system, as well as advocates. All those people need to be brought back to the table because the implementation of their recommendations just has not occurred. It is a matter of political will. I think there are a lot of things short term that the council can insist. Um, the drop-off centers need to be up and operating in great number across the five boroughs, and that needs to happen ASAP. Um, DOHMH has to expand their pilot screening program to ensure that people who would be better addressed through services rather than jail are identified and removed entirely from the criminal justice pipeline. The city has to expand its community-based substance abuse and mental health services and create more supportive housing. I've talked about the dispatch program. We heard today about the co-response teams. Those teams are few, and they operate during business hours. I've never had a client in crisis have it happen from 9 to 5. It just doesn't work that way. Those teams need to be 24-7, 365. I, the NYPD has promised to review its patrol manual. It needs to be reviewed. Use of force needs to be looked at again. Um, if only 25% of its force will be CIT trained, there has to be a protocol when responding officers come to a site, some of whom are trained, other of whom are not, as to who takes control and command of the situation. There was some discussion about that earlier without much resolution other than we're thinking about it. Um, we heard a little bit about what we would call a root cause analysis when a CIT training event, um, you know, should address failures of a CIT response in the community. It needs to be assessed. It needs to be reintroduced into the CIT training program. You've heard about the concept of community fora, which we also support. Um, I think that would go a far way to having families and people with mental health issues feel more comfortable with respect to um, their interactions with the police. Um, at the end of the day, you know, however strong the NYPD's training is, it doesn't reduce the inappropriateness of placing people in jail when services and care are not in place. We're really thankful the committee has turned its attention to this particular issue today. We hope it's the beginning of robust oversight over how the city as a whole should be responding to people with mental health issues in an effort at the end of the day to prevent more people from being killed or injured or traumatized and connected to services that are appropriate for them. Thank you. Hi, 
Thank you for looking into this issue. My name is Carla Rabinowitz, and I'm the advocacy coordinator at Community Access. I'm also the project coordinator of CCIT NYC. I forgot the T, it's CCITNYC.org. A coalition of 75 organizations and many other members um, looking into advocating for a fully responsive crisis interve intervention team approach and diverting mental health recipients away from the criminal justice system. The organization I work for, Community Access, is a 44-year-old nonprofit that empowers people with mental health concerns through providing quality supportive housing, employment training, lots of recovery. We're of the model, we, we're of the belief that people are experts in their own recovery and we treat them as such. CCIT, NYC, and Community Access request that you revive the Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice. This task force met a couple of times in 2014, issued one of its several quarterly reports, and then just went to fun. Um, and we ask that you recommend the mayor assign this task force to a deputy mayor level, as they did with the Thrive campaign. If you know of the Thrive campaign, it's doing so well because it was at the deputy mayor level. We need all stakeholders and all city and state agencies at the table to suggest alternatives to police responding to these crisis calls. We can expand co-response teams and uses of co-response teams. I think right now there are five co-response teams that operate from nine to five, that's not enough. Uh, we, maybe we need more mobile crisis teams. Maybe we can try the approach that other cities have had where they have mental health peers or other professionals uh, with police to, uh, mental health peers or other peers with police to calm down these encounters. These are a few ideas to explore. We can't explore it without a task force. Also, we need the task force because it coordinates all the agencies involved. Um, you've heard my colleague mention some of the agencies. There's so many agencies involved in a comprehensive CIT, and this task force just died. Some of the contributions of the task force have already been taken up, including CIT training for NYPD. NYPD tr training is going well. I've sat through. Um, I've sat through several of the trainings. Um, you know, I've sat through training several times. It's really going well. And countless people have been saved by CIT officers. But the problem is CIT training alone is not going to prevent the recurring deaths we had. Since the NYPD started their comprehensive CIT training, which was June 2015, at least six mental health recipients have died in police encounters. Mario Ocasio, age 51, Rashawn Lloyd, Deborah Daner, Ariel Galarza, Dwayne June, Andy Sukdio. These are the ones I looked up. We need to solve issues before mental health recipients get into crisis, right? So for that, we need funding of community services, supportive housing, more clinics. We also need alternatives to hospitals because many recipients fear the hospitals. There's places called respite care where people can stay for a week get more, it's a more comfortable setting. They get the same kind of attention, but they get like a key to their own room, much more relaxed place to be. Um, and they get linkages to long-term services. We also need to support the police by building these diversion centers. They really have been promised for a long time. Um, we need these two diversion centers up, and with the closing of Rikers, we'll probably need many more diversion centers where police can take people who are in acute crisis and hand them off for immediate care. In these um, diversion centers, the police hand the person off, no questions asked, boom, they're out back on the job, and the person gets immediate care and long-term connections to community resources. Most importantly, though, we need the mayor to revive his 2014 task force on behavioral health and criminal justice and place his task force under a deputy mayor like I did with Thrive with the resources and coordination to get things done. Once again, I thank you for turning your attention to this, and if you ever have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input, your partnership. Thank you for giving us a number of suggestions about today's hearing. Very, very important that we're talking about this, and I know many of your clients that you represent obviously um, have been involved in interactions with the NYPD. So we appreciate your input, and certainly moving forward, take a lot of the suggestions that you have made into consideration. I really appreciate it, and I thank you so much. Uh, Chair Cohen has several questions. Wait, <laughs> no, no leave, no leave. <laughs> 
questions? Uh, I really just have a, um, a, a couple, and I'm not even sure that they're questions per se, but like uh, um, one of you testified uh, uh, talking about uh, you know, people who ultimately end up being charged with relatively minor offenses uh, as the result of a, a 911 encounter. I don't know where I don't know where the 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 line is in terms of you know a textbook maybe the activity is criminal, but obviously it, it what's driving the activity is a mental health crisis. Um, I, I don't know if you know if you think you're even qualified to sort of offer an opinion, but I, I, you know as I you know even the panel from the administration we had DOHMH we had NYPD. But I don't think anybody's clear on where that line is. The truth is that the city just has a, an incredibly vigorous uh, NYP, NYPD infrastructure in place. And so they end up being the ones most uh, able to respond quickly. Um, I, but I don't know in terms of if you have any thoughts on sort of where that line is. Uh, go ahead. You well, if, if I may, I would just say that um, I think that what happens is when the, when the police respond, there are things that come out of that interaction that are sort of like, I don't know, other way to say it, it's like the natural progression. If you respond to a person who is mentally ill and experienced and very symptomatic, they might be flailing their arms when you get there. So then when we see a charge that comes back for assaulting a police officer, because that person might have, in, when they're being restrained, kicked the officer or hit the officer, that seems to be unfair because you know that you're going there and that that is the situation you're walking into. And it's not like that person is intentionally slapping at the officer, hitting the officer. It's just like it's part of the whole um, situation that's happening. So why does there have to be a charge of an assault on an officer, which, by the way, is a felony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I, I would also suggest that there is an ADA component here where the police are responding to a person with a disability and then to charge them for an escalation in behavior that is the result of the disability that was not addressed by the responding officer is inappropriate. Now, you can tr still charge the person. I would assume that that's a motion that you would make at court. But the task force report from 2014 had a whole series of recommendations about where people who came in contact with law enforcement who have a mental health issue can be diverted. It was, you know, sort of an off-ramp proposal as you think about it. And, you know, in the first instance, you want crisis intervention to prevent an escalation into the law enforcement context. But if a person is in a law enforcement context, then you have mental health court, you have representation, you have connection to services, you have diversion, you have people not being sent to Rikers to be put into solitary confinement. There are multiple ways to address it, and that's why I think a lot of us are supportive of that task force work being continued and operationalized, because it just hasn't happened. We know there are a lot of people working on these issues. Bear Justice has weekly symposiums on how to do this, pulling together all of the minds of advocates, attorneys, recipients, peers, academics, law enforcement, the judiciary. There are a lot of people looking at this. It just needs, somebody needs to be the person who is calling for accountability and sort of cracking the whip, basically, to get people going. It's not all about money. I just want to add that there's a group of people who are moving, as I said, between shelter system, corrections, the city's uh, hospitals, um, and in addition to the human cost of having people move unattended through these different systems in rotation, uh, there's tremendous cost to the city of New York. And it's one city, uh, and that city should be providing uh, care to those individuals rather than shuffling them between these systems. I, I was just curious. Um, I'm sorry. Did someone else want to, want to respond? Go ahead. Council. Well, uh, but I asked the question, so if somebody wants to respond, I'm interested in Yeah, so I think there's two things about the low-level crimes. I mean, that's something that the NYPD was asking about when, like, what is the crime level that you're going to take someone to the diversion center and just say, walk away? But I think we do have to understand that, I mean, almost everybody in the city has done something criminal at some point in their life. I think there's this criminalization of people who are mental health when they're engaging in certain behavior. Um, that we might not criminalize someone who doesn't have a mental health. The other thing I want to say is that 
um, you're closing Rikers, so you're going to have so many more people come come out, and you're going to have so many, many more of these encounters. So it is important for, and these are things for like the task force to figure out. The task force to figure out at what level can the police bring someone to the diversion center, and at what level can they not. And the last thing I want to say, in a couple of these cases, um, the person wasn't violent until the police got there. I think a couple of my colleagues here had talked about forums with the NYPD, and we, we have had a couple of the CCIT NYC before. Now we're not getting as many, and it's very important to have these forums with the NYPD and family members and the police because right now there's a lot of anger from mental health recipients toward the police. But if you look under that anger, what it is is really fear. They're afraid. They're afraid it's going to happen to them. So sometimes if they, you know, I don't want to put the onus on the mental health recipient, but sometimes the mental health recipient is going to act out or pick up a, a dinner knife or something because they're afraid when they see the NYPD. So that also, you know, so that's also a problem to address. I, that I, I do totally get. Can I, in terms of the charging versus dispositions, I mean, does someone at some point say that, uh, in your experience, that all right, this, either this person has been overcharged or, uh, like, is, is your experience that, that, that people often, that people with serious mental health issues end up with felony convictions? Is that? Is, is that I think that, um, unfortunately, we do resolve some of these issues, but they do end up taking a plea. A lot of the times, it's I think there's pressure on the DA's office that they not drop these cases, that they not that they treat them seriously, and so they do go forward with these um, cases, even where the police officer is not really hurt. Maybe it's a, I mean, we hear things about a bruised pinky. I mean, you know, uh, they hurt my finger. You know, this this is outrageous in our opinion, that a person could end up pleading guilty to a felony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to thank everyone for joining us at today's very important hearing. Um, thank you to the administration and all of the members of the public who came to testify. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to my co-chair, Council Member Andy Cohen, and thank you to the Sergeant at Arms and everyone who joined us today. This hearing of the Committees on Public Safety and Mental Health is hereby adjourned. Thank you.